Hey everyone, park your car, catch some rays, and showcase your slick automotive designs in a brand new 425 Ready beach scene. Originally created for the free automotive material pack, you can now use the peaceful lot to show off your own creations. Download the free project and materials on the Unreal Engine Marketplace. Need some help getting your scene showroom or beach ready? Our latest webinar, Photo Real Automotive Rendering in Unreal Engine is now available at youtube.com slash Unreal Engine. Learn best practices for setting up ray tracing, how to work with the free automotive material pack, material optimization, and more. With limitless avenues for customization, BTV's weekly European soccer show scores big with a new digital set from Dreamwall, a Belgian-based graphic design and animation studio that specializes in the design and production of virtual sets and augmented reality projects. With the help of Zero Density's Reality Engine, the new set feels like a full-size stadium while bringing added depth and flexibility to BTV's programming. Read on to learn how these virtual tools are changing the broadcast industry. Using a 17-foot XR-based digital twin of downtown Tampa, Florida, Amerza, in conjunction with real estate developer Strategic Property Partners and projection mapping experts DC Bolt, is literally changing how we view real estate visualization. Combining 3D printed replicas, projection mapping, and real-time technology, it's the largest and most sophisticated model of its kind known to be developed to date. See how Unreal powers these visualizations. Founded by Halo co-creator Marcus Leto, V1 Interactive parked their graph cycles to offer insight into disintegration genre-bending design. By combining first-person shooting with tactical gameplay, they created a unique experience for their sci-fi shooter. Head over to the feed to learn about the game's novel control scheme, map creation, and more from the minds behind Disintegration. Don't forget that in just a few short weeks, we'll be hosting our first ever Unreal Fest online with over 50 sessions across five industries and featuring talks on Unreal Engine and next-gen games. Dive into the agenda and register for Unreal Fest online at unrealengine.com slash unrealfestonline today. And now for our stellar devs helping out on Answer Hub. This week's top karma earners are Evil Cleric, Clockwork Ocean, Every Nun, Cheerer, T. Sumisaki, K. Rave, Corner 119, Mama Marsis, Black Forest Dragon, and Vipe Out. Thank you all for being amazing. Now over to some outstanding community creations. Embark Studios art director Andrew Hamilton created a stunning tribute to his former home in Australia built with his own photogrammetry scans. Head over to Andrew's art station page and get transported to the land down under. Sound on. Inspired by the likes of H.P. Lovecraft and Peter Cushing, Asylum is a meticulously crafted horror adventure from Argentinian studio Sinscape. Cast into Hanwell Mental Institute, explore endless corridors and solve the mystery of the decaying asylum. Check out Asylum's demo on Steam and hear directly from the Sinscape team in an interview with our Evangelist Martina. Looking for relaxing ambient soundscapes? Memoir Music has beautiful tracks for gentle listening and environment scenes built in Unreal Engine using Quixel Megascans. More recently, they launched a 24-7 stream, so give Memoir Music a watch anytime on YouTube. Thanks for watching this week's news and community spotlight. Hi everyone and welcome to Inside Unreal, a weekly show where we learn, explore and celebrate everything Unreal. I'm your host Victor Broden and my guest today is Grayson Edge. Welcome back. Hey there, how's it going? It's all good. Hope you're doing well over there as well. Uh, so you've been on the stream before, but let me introduce you as the senior cinematic <clears throat> uh, designer actually. Would you, uh, would you mind telling us a little bit about what you do at Epic? Yeah, you got it. So I've been doing cinematic design for a while and I work on a variety of things. Um, in terms of uh, Fortnite game stuff, some of, our, some of our special projects, and overall work on cinematics uh, at Epic. And more and more, I'm working on uh, events and our virtual production uh, capabilities, uh, kind of working in the trenches on that, on that stuff. And so that's kind of a general overview of the type of thing that I do currently. Is and that... uh, one of the last things you were working on was the uh, Travis Scott event, right? That's right. Yeah, Travis Scott uh, was the last event that I worked on. Um, 
And that one was a real exciting thing. We'll talk about that a little bit today, obviously. And I can talk, tell you a little bit about how we handle that and how we handle other similar events or events uh, at Epic and in terms of technologies that we use and uh, what we do under the hood for the, some of those things. Yeah, and if you uh, if you just tuned in and don't know what our topic is today, we are going to talk about uh, virtual events as well as a little bit of uh, sequencer in 425. Yeah, yeah, I've got a lot of um, a lot of stuff to talk about today, and a lot of topics to cover. I think structurally, the first part of what we'll be talking about is more uh, kind of the strategy of how we go about these events um, and how we use virtual production, primarily virtual production in in that endeavor. And then uh, towards the end, we'll be getting more into the nuts and bolts of sequencer. And this applies to all kinds of things, not just events, but obviously for cinematics uh, that can be used for uh, events and special projects and a number of things. So that's kind of the, kind of what I'm thinking in terms of structure and what we'll be talking about today. Sounds good. Let's get started. Okay. Yeah, it sounds great. So uh, yeah, so we're going to talk about virtual production um, in Unreal Engine 4. And... I think one of the important things to kind of uh, define early on is what virtual production has a lot of different meanings and can be defined in a lot of different ways. Uh, right now, when I'm talking about virtual production, I'm mostly talking about using mocap uh, in conjunction with our engine and uh, encoded devices like encoded cameras um, or using things like VR. But basically, w what we're trying to do right now uh, in virtual production in the stuff that I'm talking about is using that technology uh, with uh, engine technology to uh, essentially pre-visualize or visualize things. That's kind of like previous. So in some ways we're talking about previous here. Um, and overall, I think we're trying to move in, in some cases we are uh, moving into final pixels, but uh, for, for these events, really uh, we're going to be talking mostly about uh, previous like technologies. And I think it's incredibly powerful stuff because at the end of the day, um, this tech allows uh, big teams of people to visualize things immediately. And I think, and I'll, I'm kind of jumping ahead here, but I think overall, um, I think that's one of the greatest values for using virtual production for our events uh, in, in Fortnite and for just for events in general, is that we can get a large variety of teams together to look at things and they can visualize them at the same time, uh, discuss them and make decisions. In the past, uh, before we had some of this, uh, some of these capabilities, we would uh, sometimes people would have to wait a long time to see things. Um, we may, uh, as a team, we may assemble some ideas and then pitch those ideas, and then if those ideas weren't right, we'd have to go back to you know stage one and, and re refactor those or rethink about those. And so again, with some of the virtual production uh, technologies that we have, we're able to quickly visualize stuff. Anyway, I'll explain that more as, as we dive into it. Um, I also want to say that uh, this project for me, the uh, Travis Scott event, was a lot of fun. And I think as a team, we had a really great time working together. And we had a great time working with uh, Travis and his group. And the amount of creative feedback that they gave us was, uh, was great. And uh, we worked, I think we worked together pretty well. And I think uh, another thing to be very honest is I really like the music. I think it was... I think it made it a lot of fun um, project to work on just because it, the uh, the music itself was, was pretty awesome and there's a lot of really creative elements in in that music. So I just wanted to say, you know, oops, I probably need to turn off my phone before the Twitch stream starts. And they, <laughs> I think I missed call. that during the prep, actually. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah, people love to call um, all day on the phone. <laughs> so... Uh, but anyway, back back to the thing with um, the, the creative factor. I think you know we love. You know, I love the music. I think it's really really cool, and we have some really great design people at Epic and with the Travis team, and I think that you know working together on that was was fun, and I think we all really enjoyed it. Um, so I wanted to say thanks to some of our design team, uh, Epic too, and all the people, tons of people were involved with that. So um, I may be talking about it. Um, but I'm, I'd probably play a small, small part in the overall picture there. Um, all right, so let's just jump in and talk about uh, events and how we handle them from a st strategic standpoint. Basically, the way we we're handling events are very similar to cinematics these days. Um, they are things that take, take place over time and they need to be sequenced out. And we need to have, um, oftentimes have a continuous story that moves through time. And so 
we use a lot of the same techniques that we do um, in cinematics, like, for example, animatics. So this event and many events like it will start off uh, with an animatic. And let me get, you can see here on my screen, mm -hmm. I've got a simple image, just a, a screen for you. Um, this was a concept, I believe, um, that this one may have been done in engine, but it was a concept for the event. And we basically had an animatic with a series of still images uh, that used uh, 10 minutes of music. The track at the start was not completely decided on in terms of the order of, of music that we, would be played, but we would take these images um, and we would put them into an animatic form. So we'd see these images as the music played out so we could start to talk about some of the themes and environments and things that we might be seeing. And so we'd send that, um, you know, we work with the, the Travis team and they'd look at it and say, ah, maybe you could try this or that. And so we work with them a bit to, to, to feel that out. And I'll say that when we, when we first started this animatic, the first time I saw it, I was, I was just like, I'm not quite sure what the heck we're doing. <laughs> and, and this, you know, I think that's pretty normal. I think that as, as a creative group, we may have things that are abstract, start very abstract. And then as we discuss them, it start, it's almost like abstract art. Sometimes you look at it and it's like not clear what it is. But as you discuss it, it starts to be like, oh, that'd be really cool. And so what, what I'm going to get to with this eventually, what I'm trying to explain is that we um, will use our virtual production technologies to help visualize this stuff and make it less abstract so that we can all talk about it and see it in person and actually make real decisions that will influence the, you know, the, the overall project. But um, from a strategy standpoint, we started with animatics and a collection of images that were you know, pretty abstract. And we said, okay, let's try making this now. And so that's where we started to get into virtual production. Um, let's see what else we can talk about here. So, we, so yeah, we've got the animatic. Um, the other thing that we do also is uh, we start to, to get some of these ideas wrangled up in a spreadsheet. I'll put this full screen to so you can see it. And this can include a lot of different stuff. It uh, can include different tracks that we make, like music tracks we want to explore, uh, different people's ideas, um, where we'll literally write it down in some cases um, in, in these fields. Oops, let's go back one. In the fields, you know, down here. And it's kind of a place to store ideas. So I think just from a planning standpoint, we try to do, you know, the overall creative imagery and then we then oftentimes we'll go into like okay here are the actual beats that we want to hit and here are some ideas. There were a lot of different spreads uh, spreadsheets that we that we started, and uh, this is just one of a few. And it also this helped help track mocap and and other elements um, of things that we were going to be capturing. Right, so let me show this. Um, I think another thing is that. I'm going to jump. Actually, I'm going to jump around here a little bit, y'all. So here's a uh, picture of our mocap stage. And I'll kind of go through and explain some of the stuff. I, I, you know, probably most of you know that this is a mocap stage. You can see all the cameras uh, up here. Uh, we've got a big speaker here. We've got several speakers spread around. And we ended up playing our music tracks through, through that so uh, we could hear them and we could you know, work in that environment and hear the music. And then we would see the environment in Unreal. Uh, we've got a series of screens. You can see one here. There's another big one here. And we would get the Fortnite team, key, uh, key people from the Fortnite team over. And we'd all talk about what you know, the event was going to be like. And we would fire up the engine, you know, start the engine up. And we'd open up the Fortnite world. And the first thing we knew is that we knew we wanted to have um, a giant character in the event. And so um, that's one thing to talk about that and see it in, you know, in the Fortnite world or you know, imagine what it might be like in the Fortnite world. It's another thing to actually open up the engine and see that character in the Fortnite world and start working with that character um, in terms of like how they look in the environment, what's their scale like. So long story short, we got a lot of people together to look at this stuff and we started scaling up the character and we started off kind of small and we got bigger and bigger and bigger. So we tried different scales until Travis was you know, huge. It looked awesome. It's really cool. Um, and then we picked a location. And so we used, um, you know, again, we used virtual production to do all that. So we were 
basically picking a location in the Fortnite world. We'd have an actor in a mocap suit would stand in on the Fortnite island. He was scaled up a hundred times, um, and then he could move around the island, and we could have him stand and, and kind of fake perform in different areas to kind of see what a performance in that area might look like. And in that case, it was almost like a kind of a uh, scouting. We were pretty much like scouting the area. And so um, we quickly decided on an area, the bay that we ended up uh, shooting all that in. It just seemed like a really natural stage setup. And although the event is in 3D, we also wanted to have kind of a 2D component to it that just like a, a piece of landscape that naturally felt like you were going to be uh, like an amphitheater almost. So it, it kind mm-hmm. of felt a little bit amphitheater-like. And, um, and so that's why we picked that location. But we were able to do that as a team very, very quickly. Now, in the past, this type of decision could take, sometimes could take a week or two for everybody to kind of think about it and, and look at different locations or look through a bunch of images. But because we were able to get that live uh, in engine on the stage, we, we picked it in a few minutes. And I think that's one of the, the big powers of virtual production for us in these events is that really we can just visualize stuff you know, very quickly and we can discuss it as a team. Were you um, using uh, virtual yeah. scouting th- between you guys to be able to figure out if that was a spot that you all liked? So when I say scouting, what we were doing is it's very much like a shot or locate, really location scouting because um, what we would do is we would get the mocap actor on uh, Fortnite Island and then we'd say, all right, you know, let's go and stand over here. And then what we're looking at are these 2D screens uh, out here. Let me maximize that. We're looking um, at these 2D monitors and we're a group of people kind of crowded around some of these monitors. And we're just looking at how um, you might actually be able to see it. Can you see this? Little, uh, this little image here. Yeah, that's actually the island, and that's Travis, and that's exactly what we were doing. Um, it's just, you know, of course, it wasn't at that time, it wasn't Travis Scott, it was just a um, um, one of our mo- stand in mocap actors to help us kind of scout out that area. Um, so we could, in theory, very much use uh, VR to do the same thing. So we could have stood in the environment and looked at it mm-hmm. as well. And that's something I'd like to, um, actually, I'll go ahead and talk about it now because it really is kind of relevant. So although we didn't do that um, on this shoot in this particular event, we do have the capabilities or the ability to use uh, multi-user, which is, uh, I can explain in a second, multi-user and even these video uh, cameras out there to have people remote remote uh, view our sessions. So for example, Travis's team, if they wanted to see what we were doing or give feedback to us, they could very easily use um, uh, you know, just look either through multi-user um, or through um, through regular stage cameras, but also they could have, in theory, joined us through for, uh, through uh, virtual reality and VR. So they could have had tele little in a telepresence in the uh, environment to see all this going on, and that could have been virtual presence on stage or a virtual presence in the Fortnite uh, Fortnite world. Yeah, I'll go ahead and, and <clears throat> share the uh, link to the multi-user live stream that you did. Um, okay. That you did a couple of months ago. Cool. Yeah, I think that, and if you're interested in multi-user uh, capabilities, we're finding right now with all the, the um, you know, everybody's working from home, or a lot of people are working from home, mm-hmm. um, that it is a really good uh, system for us. We'll continue to do our work. We're meeting these groups in uh, sometimes virtual environments, and um, it's great for continuing to shoot stuff and to continue to do uh, to develop content, you know, creative content. But in this image, you can also see this is our mocap stage. You can see back here under by the Unreal logo, there's a microwave back there and some <laughs> food that we all, because we're always out there, all done, always there. But we're often there a long time and you know, getting, we get hungry. But, um, but these are also a series of monitors here. And these, this is our MU setup. All these machines here on stage are set up for multi-user. And uh, those monitors we, we use for um, a series of machines that all have specific roles. Some control cameras, some control uh, tape recorder and sequencer. Others we can adjust lighting. And that's something kind of cool. We didn't really get too deeply in it, or too deep into experimenting with a lot of different lighting setups for this event. But we have started to experiment a little bit more of that so that we can have people in a multi-user environment and they can... Uh, People can control things like certain animations. They can trigger off events. They can trigger lights. They can do all kinds of cool stuff. Yeah, so it's really, really 
Mm-hmm. I'd recommend to watch the uh, the previous live stream that you did. There's even a little bit of behind the scenes footage from uh, from the from the stage here, and including the use of those multi user editor workstations. Cool. Yeah, it's it's a lot of good stuff. But and just to very briefly, very very briefly explain it, it's basically like allows many people to work on the same content. So if you there's a matter, imagine if you're using the editor and there's like five or six other people in there at the same time helping you. Um, that's kind of what multi user is. Is a very brief explanation. Anyway, that I, I wanted to mention that that you know we can work with clients. Um, for example, for doing events, those type of things, they can actually come in either virtually or they can join us uh, while we're doing our work, and they can you know uh, help participate in creative mm-hmm. uh, cr- creative elements of that and feedback. So we get immediate feedback from from, from teams that we're working with. Um, and overall, we you know we're using virtual production to problem solve. Uh, some stuff that usually, you know, when, it, when it's one or two people behind their screens and they've got to then go and share it with a large team, it can take a lot of time. So we're just cutting down the amount of time that it takes for those type of things to happen and in some ways reducing complexity. Um, another thing we do uh, in terms of planning for these events is you can see on the floor here, uh, there's a series of tape marks. And all those tape marks are uh, representative of the Fortnite Island. And so on the screen back there, you can see the island. And we went through and we use a marker, a series of markers that's like a, imagine a broomstick with a bunch of mocap markers on it. Uh, we can place those down on the floor and then we can see where that position is in the, in the engine. And then we end up marking, uh, we can do tape markers on, on the floor. And then that becomes, that was the island and that helps inform the mocap actor where they can and they can't step. Um, you can see this little, little yellow um, yellow uh, box here and that was a um, that was the marker for the docks in Fortnite FNBR. Anyway, that's just kind of the process that we use for um, it's pretty standard standard practice. but it's cool once you get it all set up, um, you know the, the actor is basically performing in a smaller version of that space there um, that they basically can perform over the entire island. And again, at this point Travis was scaled up hundred times. And so that was the actual size of the island. A few of these little marks, you can see that. And I think I have a slide specifically showing that up. Oh, I just want to be very clear about that. Um, if I show you that, here's, here's the um, animation director, one of the animation directors. And um, this is our mocap actor, uh, stand in mocap actor for this is when we're starting to block some things out. Mm-hmm. And I'll go ahead and, and kind of talk a little bit about this image too in a second, more about it. But as you can see, all the arrows, these are tape marks, and that represented the island and where we would be walking. Now, again, you could use AR for this. You could use VR for this. Um, and even we will sometimes, some stages, we use projectors, uh, just regular you know, 2D projectors that will project the image map or the you know, location on the floor, which is kind of cool. And so uh, right here, what we're looking at is this was the motion capture for the Skull Troopers. This was not motion capture for Travis. This was motion capture for the Skull Troopers that we see um, in the underwater section of that event. And they were they were also about, um, they were scaled up 100 times, so they were giant, you know, really huge. And we've got, Mark is, is holding uh, Carter back here with a rubber band, basically like a, a Lastaband thing. And we were trying to capture some really cool motion that looked like you were moving, you know, like the, the characters were moving underwater, so it had this weight. And um, I think we have a video of that somewhere. I can I can pull up in a second here and show you show you guys that. Um, another thing we did uh, was in so that, again this is virtual production stuff. Another thing we did here was use this rail. If you can see this rail back here, let me see if I go back. A couple images. Yeah, there's a little closer view of it. So what we did. Um, we had a section where we wanted uh, to we wanted to experiment with Travis uh, falling down through the water through the sea, and it just was looked like it would be a really cool you know cool image and and so we wanted to visualize that on the stage and to see what that might look like and you know for the final product and did it work did it not work and so what we did um, is we used this rail to slide back and forth and we mapped it to up and down direction. So it was up mapped on the Z axis. And so if you move to the far left, it would be uh, top of the Z, you know, high up. And if you move down to the bottom, it would be low. 
And so we basically, I hope this, this may be a little confusing, but basically we took the mocap actor and we attached them to that uh, rail in, in, in virtual space, not in the real world, obviously, but in, um, in the engine. And we were able to translate that. Um, when we moved that rail, the actor would literally move up in space or down in space. And so what we did is we had the um, we had Carter, who's a mocap actor, uh, lay on one of these boxes in the background there in the mocap suit, and he he would uh, kind of lay on his back. And so when we saw him in the virtual environment, he was basically floating. It looked like he was floating in water. And then we'd have somebody uh, drive that rail, and so it basically it would slowly sink him through the water, which is really cool. So now like we've got. Um, we're basically visualizing what that might look like uh, without necessarily having a full animation team or somebody spending all this time going through and doing all the animation. And we could experiment with different scales of that model uh, from a viewer's perspective and also the speed at which that uh, actor fell. And so we ended up doing, um, you know, trying a couple of different things and then started capturing that motion, which was, which was pretty cool. And so, um, we have a you know a couple different ways of capturing motion. Um, we can do it with our motion capture system, where the uh, mocap uh, operators sit back here and then we'll record what the actor is doing, and that is that creates a like a, a FBX or a Maya file basically um, that we can then pull back into engine. But we also have tape recorder, which is really cool because that is directly recording the motion on the mocap stage uh, with like with tape recorder, basically it's recording engine data and that is immediately accessible. We can start editing and working with that. And so um, we can take that data and even modify it right on the spot if we want to. So it's really cool for, uh, for quick workflows. And so that was a big part. Um, and that's a big part of what we do for virtual production uh, on Fortnite is we, we will use uh, tape recorder. And I can, you know what, I'm, I'll pull it up real quick. If you're not familiar with the tool, I'll, I've got it in the background here. Um, it's, this is tape recorder. It lets you add actors from, from your scene in here and basically record them. There's a big red button here. It lets you record that stuff. And um, we'll, we'll basically record um, actors on the stage and then we're able to preview, you know, play, play that stuff back. Uh, something else that we, we used a lot of um, was for this particular event, let me uh, load this up, was uh, music. So obviously you wanted to hear the music and see what an actor might, uh, how, how we might get some performances out of that with an actor. And so again, we use our uh, mocap actor to kind of prototype some of that and, and figure out you know, how we're gonna capture motion. And so this is tape recorder. I'm gonna load up something called a preset here, which is cool. And it basically loads up um, some properties that we already have pre-populated. In this case, um, I've pulled up a file that has audio and audio track in here. And this is, imagine if this was a music track. This is currently just a voice track. But when we record, it will basically take this timeline and scrub through there and play, uh, play sound back as we're recording. And so that's incredibly useful if you want to time um, actions to, to a music or if you have very specific time stamps you're trying to hit. And so, for example, if you can see here, there are these three uh, audio tracks here. Um, these are beeps. They're basically little beeps, and it's kind of like, I guess you could call this a radio play, where you uh, you have uh, a piece of audio that you want to perform to, um, or it's just, in this case, it's just a piece of audio we're going to try to get the actor to hit certain marks on. And so we did a couple things with this. Um, number one, these, these uh, audio tracks here were very specific times where the actor didn't need to see the timing. All they needed to know was to like hit your mark on these beeps, on these three beeps. And so when we started recording, you know, we'd have time going through, and then a few seconds later, you know, I can show it to you here. Yeah, we were unfortunately not able to, um, the way we had the screen share set up, yeah, we cannot unfortunately hear it. Well, it's, uh, it's just a series of three beeps. And, Long story short, that just gives an actor a cue and uh, lets them perform to to that um, to that time uh, or hit that hit that mark. Mm -hmm. And so that's really useful for timing. And then you've got this other track down here, which is an audio track. Um, and again, that's the voice. 
a voice track, but it could be music. And for the, the Travis Scott event uh, in particular, we used we did use um, audio tracks. So we were there were tracks that were kind of some of them work work in progress or existing tracks that we knew of that we were trying out. And we could actually change, which is really cool. You can change the uh, play rate of that, and I'll explain why we did this in a minute uh, to talk a little bit about the process there. But basically, if I wanted to play this uh, 1.5 times speed and record that, um, then we could do that pretty easily just through that number there. And we did um, we did change the, I'm sorry, it's actually the pitch. I had the volume selected. Same idea, though. You just change the pitch value there. So we, we did that for the Travis Scott event for this reason. We wanted to play in terms of just for development, only, obviously only for development, not for the final product. We wanted to play the music back at 1.5 times play play rate because we wanted to slow the motion down for the uh, 100 times scale character. It sounds a little funky, and yeah, it is a little funky in terms of how it all works, but um, the idea is that if you have a big character, generally speaking, video games, and I guess in movies as well, if you have a giant character, um, they have a feeling like they move a little slower, and I think it has a lot to do with parallax and small micro movements of the character. So traditionally, um, animators will, in the past would have taken a big character and they would have spent a lot of time cleaning up the motion. So they would have, if they got a you know, simple uh, motion capture version of uh, the motion, they would probably have to go down um, probably a several week or a several day path trying to clean up that animation to slow it down and make it look right at a slower speed. Uh, for us, we came up with a method that I think would work pretty well um, that we captured music so the actor would perform uh, this a lot of this was concept stuff so the actor in concept would perform and uh, at 1.5 times speed which gets a little tough right i mean in terms of performing to that type of thing and we this is all during the testing phase we were testing this out and we would play the music back at 1.5 times speed and then in the engine and on the engine side we'd actually slow it down by this a, a math number here by 0. 0.667 um uh, as a value, we just slow it down. And so it looked right when you play it back. If music plays back at one point at a speed, you would get uh, that playback at uh, 0.667. Let me just sh see if I've got this. Um, well, maybe I, I, you know what? I don't think I need to show it. I'll just, I'll just explain it. Anyway, that was a math, a number that we derived uh, based on percentages. And it worked. And it was cool because we could play this uh, 1.5 speed and then we would, uh, afterwards, we'd slow that animation down uh, by by 0.667, and then play it back in engine, and it all it all timed out right. And that way, uh, Travis was able to perform to the music, or at least the virtual version of it, was able to perform to the music uh, in time. So at, at one point of play rate, he looked really big, and he's motion, but he had hit all the beats perfectly, but the motion was a little slower. So it was kind of cool. And I think um, in terms of being from a tech, technical standpoint purely, I think being able to do that type of stuff and experiment with that type of stuff is one of the powers of virtual production. Um, and that we can very quickly, you know, experiment with those, those type of things and see, see how it all looks in the, in the final pro, uh, project. product. Sorry. Oh, that's very cool. Um, yeah, it's a lot of, lot of fun. So there's some other things that we can look at here. Um, we also... Let's see if we look at this. this. This is from the YouTube video. I just got a quick clip of this. I sent the link in chat earlier. And if you're watching this on the VOD, the link will also be in the YouTube description as well as the uh, forum announcement post. So once we get all this, this data back, we can, we can go in and so we get all this motion capture data that we've got. Um, we'll bring it back into the engine. So some of it we can pre, you know, pre visualize and, and see what it looks like live. And that's I'm telling you, that's where a lot of great problem solving happens, which is cool. The other part of that is where we take the data that we've got and we start to play around with it in the engine. And that's um, that's definitely where we can you know start to experiment with some things that we couldn't necessarily do live or we could do live, but it may take a little more effort um, to do. So in this case, we hadn't we had talked about having um, you know one of these characters sitting on top of uh, a building, you know, wrapping, and we basically pulled all this data back into engine and decided, let's do it on a planet. Let's see what it looks like. You know, let's try it on a planet. And so we ended up getting uh, some really cool stuff just, just through experimentation in the engine. And so we usually um, 
go through. And once we have the motion, we'll have to, we spend a bit of time getting it all timed out, right? And everybody will look at it as a team and say, oh, you know what? We need more, we need another, you know, 30 seconds here, or like this animation is too fast. Basically, all that stuff is back in engine now, and we can look at it and start playing around with it. And we can look at the overall event and see, okay, what's the overall length of the event? What are the problems? Like, where are the problem areas? What parts don't read clearly? What parts do read clearly? And then we can show that. The cool thing, and I'm, again, maybe jumping ahead, we can show that to uh, the creative team. So, like, for Travis and his team, we can say, hey, what do you guys think of this? And they'd be like, oh, that's that's cool, man. That's great. Or they can give us feedback if they need to. And that was kind of cool. Um, so we do, in terms of um, reviews and stuff, we do reviews internally, and we do reviews with exter external partners as well. And uh, But the, being able to visualize all the stuff in Engine helps us do that very quickly. And you, you get a pretty good look at the final product of what, what you'll be making. Uh, let's see, what else can I tell you about this? I guess once we have um, the basic stuff laid out for these events, I say the basic stuff. I mean, all the different, if you've seen the event, there's a lot of different stuff that goes on uh, in those events. But once we have, we, we always call it the broad strokes of all that laid out. Um, we generally go into something kind of like a lockdown mode where we say, you know what, we're not going to change a lot of timings at this point. And I'll explain a bit why we don't do that you know, too much. But uh, we then begin to roll in a larger team. And so usually this stuff starts off with a kind of small, small group of people that are kind of forming, forming the, the core, mm -hmm. the core idea of it, and then um, there's a lot of cool creative exploration that goes on there, and then we'll start rolling on a bigger art team, and this becomes and this is very much like our cinematic pipeline where we start, like in terms of cinematics, it's like usually layout, previs layout, and then at some point we say, ah, this is what we're going to make, and we get some uh, agreement from everybody on that, and then we really push forward quickly. And um, and that's when the big team rolls on. And it's kind of cool though because these events, like, they all start off some really awesome ideas. But once the like the big, you know, the all all these artists and all these other people join in on this, it, you can very quickly get some amazing stuff that's just like, oh, we never thought about that. It'd be it'd be really cool. And it gets really exciting at that point because I think at that point it all starts to take shape and everybody can see it and everybody's participating in ideas. And so it's um. It's pretty cool, you know, at, at that point. But I think you really have to, in order to get to that point where it becomes fun and you really get to polish stuff up, you really have to establish um, what the thing is that you're making. If you don't know that going into it, it's a big mess. It's, it's the opposite of that. It's a train wreck and everybody, uh, it, it's hard to do, uh, to get stuff done because you still may be fooling around with timings. You still may be fooling around with core ideas and concepts. And so I think we use we really use virtual production to help us get to that point where everybody can see what we're going to make, and then we're 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 going and we're making it. Now I would like to say too that like for virtual production, we we do have ways of doing that all the way to the end. Although in this case we're not talking about that. I'm just talking about getting it you know to to basically using it for previs and some sort of really high level concept stuff, which is cool. Um, let's see what else I can show you um so let me show you the uh layout here of the actual nuts and bolts of how we do this in sequencer and i i feel pretty strongly about this like the stuff i'm going to be talking about in these images because i've done a lot of this work and i i feel like i have a pretty good grasp on what works and what doesn't and so we're, what we're looking at let me get full screen what we're looking at in this image is the Travis Scott uh, event in Sequencer. This is the master level sequence. Uh, we had a code name. We called it Jerky um, because we were all, we always had these weird special project names. That day, one of our guys was eating beef jerky, and we had we have tons and tons and tons of beef jerky around the office, and we're uh, so that is, apparently that became the name. I, I it's kind of silly, but anyway, that's why we have Jerky there. Um, We've, we, as you know, Victor, we have some pretty strange project names. <laughs> well, and you do need a name like that, right? Because yeah. otherwise, how are you referring to it without a name, right? So it doesn't really matter what it is. We all just need a name that, that we can refer to so that we know what we're talking about. Yes. Um, yeah, I didn't want to leave any, any of that open for interpretation. It's all, <laughs> yeah, that's pretty funny. But um, 
Yeah, so this guy, literally, you go to his desk, and a lot of times he has beef jerky everywhere. <laughs> it's pretty fun. All right, so so we're looking at a master sequence here, and all of these are sub-scenes. And there's a basically, there's a lot of questions about what's a master, and what's a sub-scene, what's a level sequence. Mm -hmm. They're all basically the same thing. They are not basically, they are essentially the same thing. It's just how they're presented. Like, usually a master sequence is a level sequence, and a level sequence is a level sequence, but a level sequence can live in a master. And it's really just an organizational tool, uh, how things are organized. So each of these uh, sub-scenes, I'll go, I'll go through these in pretty good detail because I think it is useful to know if you're doing this type of thing. The event starts here and plays all the way to the end here. That's about 10 minutes okay. of time. We're looking at 10 minutes time here. Um, you'll see there's like, let's just use the animation intro. Uh, these series, these are, I'll just call these discrete units of time. They're almost like acts. So over here, you may have had the uh, underwater uh, track, you know, where we see Travis floating down through the water um, or highest in room or whatever you want. If you're going to go by visual or if you want to call it the, the music name. Um, these are all different parts, basically different parts of the, the uh, event sequence. And so what we do is, number one, um, we try to segment these out into very discrete units. This one is a really good example of how it should be. And you'll see that sometimes other types of tracks follow the same lines here. For in an ideal situation, and this, we've done some stuff since then that's um, you know that more is more event like, and we've kind of refined this even more. But I really suggest if you plan on doing this type of stuff, uh, make sure that your your acts are all very much compartmentalized uh, for every all these different tracks. And I'll explain what these different tracks are. And the reason for all that is that it allows you to very easily move things around. When you get these really com complex events that are 10 minutes long, if you try to move one little keyframe down here, let's just pick any keyframe like this keyframe, you've got to move everything in these sub-scenes um, that amount of keyframes, potentially. So um, I, I'll explain that more in a little bit. But first, let me, let me explain the, uh, what, what we're looking at here. So on the top level, you have a sub-scene. Right, and each of these sub scenes is going to look like each one of these uh, bars here will look like something like this. So there's a lot of data in there, right? Not all of them are this complex. This was, this one was just a bit more uh, had a lot of stuff in it, and I think this was uh, one of the animation tracks. Okay, so we have gameplay up here. Gameplay is mostly event tracks, mostly stuff that's going to happen in game, and so for these events. We use sequencer to kind of sequence out time and how things play out. Um, and it's easy to visualize that and to, to work with the timing on it. But they also trigger uh, in-game events in the Fortnite world. So for example, you could have somebody, if you wanted to, um, to turn gravity off, there's an event track in the jerky gameplay that turns gravity off. If you wanted to give players a special weapon or if you wanted to change their skins or whatever you wanted to do, um, that's the stuff that's usually controlled in the jerky gameplay track. And that essentially looks like, uh, let's see if I can find one here. I don't think there are any uh, they're showing, but it's an event track that triggers off an event in the game world. And that's where a lot of the gameplay uh, folks will be working and testing stuff out and, and running things. Uh, animation, so the next one down here, animation, that stores animations. Um, and this one is kind of, shows you some of the stuff that's in there. That's mostly just skeletal mesh tracks, uh, some effects, well, at least for animation effects type stuff. Um, and that's that's kind of what we store in there. That's usually, so to simplify it, it's, think of the performance, right? So if it's a pre-baked or pre-canned performance, that's where it'll be stored. So any animation you see. Uh, we've got an audio track, and that's often where we keep um, the master audio track for you know for music in this case it was you know, 10 minutes of audio um sometimes that'll have uh, a couple different audio tracks we we created an audio track that had a beats track where you have little blips on every beat major beat and that just makes help lining up events and stuff a little easier um and we get rid of those at the end obviously but those are in there to, to help people we've got effects an effects track here um so all the effects for the event and as this plays through, all this stuff is triggering off and happening at the same time. And again, you know, keeping these segmented so that you know when you move the animation stuff, the effect stuff moves with it. It's really helpful in uh, reducing complexity. 
Uh, jerky world, that's just things out in the format world that may need to get affected with a skybox, certain, certain types of effects, lighting. Um, but more just world events. And in fact, that one in particular wasn't, I don't think there was a lot in there. Um, we have some force feedback. So um, kind of like the gameplay, we have, uh, you know, vibration control, like camera shakes, or player mm -hmm. camera shakes, and vibration shake, shakes and that type of thing, which is really cool. Um, there are some more effect tracks here. Cam and then there are also additional camera shakes. These were a different type of uh, camera shake. Those are more for um, global player camera shakes. And then there's uh, jerky lighting. And then that's just simply the lighting for, for, the, um, for the sequence. And that will take us to different lighting environments as, as we get it through there. Again, if this was perfectly done, it would have been segmented into uh, all these would have been all in, the, all in the same line. That's that's kind of the way that we set these up, and this bottom uh, camera down here that was a camera uh, someone added for uh, just kind of general coverage of the event. Now, if we want to, from a marketing perspective, it's actually pretty cool because had we planned this out a little more, uh, we could have potentially gotten all the marketing cameras we wanted for videos. Um, we could have shot that in virtual production live on the stage. We could have played this thing back and shot that live uh, from a, any number of angles. Uh, on the mocap stage, or in theory, I mean, not in theory, we've done this, you can use your cell phone um, and sit, you know, like I can sit at my desk here and actually shoot this stuff if I wanted to with a virtual camera, uh, which is really cool. We did a stream then, on that as well. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. Uh, like, since we've been, you know, all working at home and stuff, I usually would use an iPad if we're on the stage mm -hmm. to, you know, to, to shoot stuff. But I've gotten a few shots off with, with a cell phone, which is really, really cool. Um, it's a lot of fun. So um, anyway, the, the point of that was that you can uh, get cameras for rendering. We also use the cameras uh, for regression testing and just to kind of see, like, at the end of the day, we send out a video. It's kind of like dailies of, like, here's the state of, of, you know, of the event. And art teams can look at it, and they can go through, and they can say, oh, it, you know, two minutes, 20 seconds, there is a you know, problem with this texture. And they can flag it. We may put it in shotgun. And go through and and, uh, and um, fix that stuff. So there's a lot of different things, a lot of cool stuff you can do with, with the tools there. Mind explaining what shotgun is? Um, sure. Uh, like in, in real general terms, it's it's a great program for tracking art tasks, and um, and we will submit. So for example, here's a classic example of how this might work. One of the many things it can do. To we would uh, we have a shotgun account um i'm let's just say i'm an artist that, that like i'm i'm working on cinematics and the uh effects or maybe let's just say like the effects director says oh yeah there's a problem with the camera and the way the effects um happen at frame whatever or two minute 20 seconds and there will be a video in there that will show the problem and there's kind of like a task for it you know the official documentation for it and I can go in, I can read that, and then I can make the fix and say, yep, I fixed it, and enter the, enter the fix there, or make a comment about it, like, oh, actually, this needs to go to your effects team because it has nothing to do with the camera. It's more about an effects issue. Um, and then they, they'll get, you know, switched to a new, new person of task. They can, you know, people can track stuff that way. That was probably a really butchered job of explaining. <laughs> I was going <laughs> to say, it sounds like a... Uh... A collaboration tool specifically for visualizations of some kind. Yeah, I mean, we're able to. We it's great for. I use it. You know, we'll use it a lot for task tracking and okay. uh, pro project tracking and giving um, artists and just people who are working. It doesn't have to be artists, but different people working on a project insight into the progress of the project, new stuff that's coming down through the concept pipe. They can see that um, if they have bugs or things, content they need to work on or refine, they can see that and interact. It's just a way of organizing all that, I believe. But again, I, I probably butchered that a little bit, but that's that's generally how my interactions have been with it. That and RB, which is really cool. I believe everyone watching has the opportunity to go Google it if they would like a little bit more information. Yeah. So good job. <laughs> Thanks, Victor. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So um, yeah, and so that's that's mostly the, the setup uh, on these. So here's another uh, thing to let's talk about this a little bit. 
Again, the reason why I keep harping on the, the making sure that you're properly uh, segmented, or I call it dis in discrete units, is that you get this type of thing where you have to move a keyframe here. Let's say we wanted to insert a few seconds of space in here, like 10 seconds, for timing reasons, because you know what, we need to retime something. There are a lot of changes that need to ha happen uh, in that case. The old days of matinee, at the time, it was a very powerful tool and it's served a lot, a lot, it's had a lot of mileage. Um, one of the problems we got into that was if you had a sequence that looked kind of like what we're looking at here, and you want to insert time or do things, it could take a huge amount of time to move all those keyframes to the left and to the right of that and make sure that everything was still in alignment. Now we get into a little bit of that here, and this is the worst case scenario, um, but because we have these sub scenes, we can just pick this stuff up and move it instead of having to do tons and tons of uh, minute detail in terms of moving timing. And so that's why I say it's really important to keep um, these, these things discrete so you can move them together. And so if you get into this type of event work or even you know, advanced cinematics and stuff, you'll start to see, that, see kind of what I'm talking about. So um, I think Sequencer allows us, it's a great tool that allows us to organize complex things. And that was, as far as I know, that's one of the biggest um, things that we're really designed to do is allow us to, to handle complex cinematics and sequences like this, and which it, which it does pretty well. Um, we'll come back and look at some, some of the stuff that's in here later. But uh, let's talk a little bit about spawnables. And I've got some examples of that. Let's look, actually, let's look at here, look in here first. So you can, so any of these tracks, you'll notice that most all of these tracks, I think almost, yeah, every one of them pretty much, um, you see a little lightning bolt next to the actor. So this Travis Planet Origin, right? You can see that track and you see this little lightning bolt here. That's a spawnable. And it's a, essentially a transient actor that only lives in this sequence. It doesn't live the levels, it doesn't live anywhere else. It just lives in the sequence. And so as you're scrubbing through, um, let's just say this jerky animation too, if my timeline was here and I'm playing through there, now it exists. And as I come out, now it doesn't. And so it only lives, uh, in, in these sequences. And these are incredibly useful for <clears throat> large teams. Um, when we traditionally, when we store uh, an actor in the level, it's, we call it a possessable. And it's great. And let, actually, I'll just go ahead and show you. And Victor, let me know if we're running late here or running, you know. We're still we doing good on time. Okay, cool. Um, it's funny because I'm always talking about this stuff and when, when we talk about sequencer and, and some of the virtual production stuff that we do. And I'm always like, oh yeah, I've explained it before, but actually I just wanted to make sure that people, are, like, if you haven't seen this or you're unfamiliar with this, it's kind of important to know about, especially as you get into more and more complex events or complex uh, sequences. So right now we have this cube. This cube lives in this level. So it's, I just created a level called Spawnable's level. And this cube lives in this level. It's a, it's a permanent resident actor uh, of this level. We also have um, a, uh, I'm sorry, this is a possessable. This is a possessable that lives in there all the time. We also have a spawnable in here, but I'll have to open the sequence to show that to you. So this cube right now, it doesn't show up anywhere here, but once I scrub into the sequence, it appears and basically spawned, spawned into the sequence. When I scrub away from that, it goes away. And so that's, that's a spawnable. Um, then one of the great advantages of working with spawnables is that you don't have to save uh, the level to save the asset that you created in the sequence. So usually with sequences, you have to, you know, you have to save the level. So you go up here, go file, save level, whatever it is up there. And then you have to save this thing as well, the sequence, to make sure all the states are preserved and everything's uh, saved. And the cool thing about this is that in order to make changes to this cube, so if I wanted to change the scale, uh, let's just say I did that. I want to change the scale a little bit, rotate it. I don't have to save the level anymore. I just uh, save the sequence. And that's really important for um, these big complex events. And here's why. Back to here. Oops. So if we go back um, to this, you can see that if there's a lot of these, uh, if we had a team of 200 people working on an event, and there's only six levels, there's no way that, or only a few, a handful of levels, maybe it's three in some cases, literally, 
um, there's no way that all those people are going to be able to check all that stuff out um, right. and work on it. So Spawnables completely circumvents that, right? Because all, all these actors are now saved. All these Spawnable actors are saved in the sequences. And so an artist can check out, um, check out, for example, I'll check this out and make my change and check it back in. And people can still be working on all this other stuff, right? And in most cases, if we were just using levels, or possessables in levels, um, nobody else could probably do anything. So it's a um, it's a really great tool for these events um, to, to, to let a lot, large teams of people work on stuff. Just to clarify, there was a question in chat. Um, to clarify, the possessables that exist in the level, they are completely separate from the spawnables. You are able to add a spawnable directly to the sequence, right? You don't actually need an actor in the scene to be able to add it to the sequence. Is that right? Yeah, let me show you. So here, let's just do this. Um, so this is a cube, right? This is possessable because I just dragged it in the world. You can see it here, right? Mm -hmm. um, now I can also do that and drag it in here. And it, you literally just drag it into Sequencer. And now it lives in Sequencer only. But you'll see it in the world outliner here, and mm -hmm. but you'll also see that it has a transient state. This little lightning bolt tells you that when I close the sequence down, or if I, let's just disable the spawn, it goes away. It's no longer there. Um, so any actor from the content browser, let's see, let's do static mesh here. Let's just drag something like um, whatever this, this thing. Get a sequencer. You can, actually, this is a cool little tool. I don't know if you know this, but um, one of one of our guys in San Francisco showed me this the other day. I lived years not knowing this. But you can literally just drag stuff right over the tab. I actually didn't. Yeah, it's it saves. It's great for one screen work too. Like if you have mm -hmm. multiple monitors, it's yeah, it's cool. But um, for one screen, it saves you a lot of time. So anyway, this this thing is now spawnable, and so you can add any actor that you want in there. I'm not is sure it what that is. possible to convert a possessable into a spawnable? Yes, it is. So you can go. Um, in this case, I would add actor to the sequence. Okay. Now I'm losing the sequence. You didn't need to add it. I believe you need to add it first, and then you go up here and you go convert to spawnable. Boom, and now it's a spawnable. I will say that my recommendation to you is that if you do that, make sure you thoroughly vet it because different builds may, uh, I've seen a, a bug or two in there in the years that I've worked with this. Although it's pretty, as far as I know, 425 it should be rock solid. Um, but I, what I would do is I'd immediately save your sequence and then immediately save your level. And then uh, occasionally if you're doing thousands and thousands, literally thousands of operations, you may see garbage collection issues occasionally. Um, that means you'll see something that's not really there. But the easiest way to solve that, if you run into that problem, is just shut down the editor and restart it. Um, but yeah, long, long story short, that's, I, I really haven't, I don't think you'll run into any of that stuff. I think it's, it's pretty simple, pretty simple to do. You can also convert actors, um, like this cube, I convert back to a possessable as well if I want to. Um, yeah, convert to possessable, there it is. Okay. And now that lives there. So it's, yeah, it's pretty cool. Again, save everything as soon as you do mm -hmm. that. To make sure you're saving it. Uh, if you're like me, you'll get busy with a lot of stuff and you'll forget you haven't saved it. So, okay, so that, that goes over the spawnables. That's really what I wanted to show you. And again, this is for um, workflows uh, for, for large teams. I think they're, they're pretty uh, pretty cool. It allows a lot of people to work on stuff at the same time. Yeah, and that's also why you have so many different tracks as part of the the master sequence, right? Because that allows everyone to dig into a specific um, a specific sequence, and you know, someone can work on four minutes and thirty seconds to four minutes to forty seconds for the you know specifically for the VFX, and someone else can work on a camera track or. Um, yeah. So two things that allows people to segment that up so they can work on it. And number the other thing is that it allows us if you want to if you're trying to add time to things and change times, once you move one of these pieces, like say we want to insert 10 seconds at the start of this uh, jerky animation to this thing here, um, we would move these things, those things, insert the time in there. But that way we don't have to go through all this other stuff and make sure it's all in alignment. So it's just a, a good way to contain our eyes compartmentalizing that. And I think that's why you mentioned why sort of the, the jerky lighting track there should have been, um, optimally, it should have been several, right? So that someone didn't have to check them out. 
Exactly. 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 Yeah. So I mean, I, I I showed you this. It's not you know obviously it's not perfect, but I hey. wanted. To, I, think I think it's a great example to. <laughs> I was going to say, yeah. game development is never perfect. The game might come out and look like everything was just you know done on one one track going straight towards the shipping yeah. line. Um, that is, I don't think I've ever seen that being the case. <laughs> yeah, I know it's totally totally. Um, and you know, honestly, like we're always refining our process. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're literally doing. We've done you know hundreds of cinematics over the years, maybe more. And this is stuff we do every day. You know, and our like our cinematics team, they're still refining their process of naming conventions and how we organize stuff. And honestly, it's uh, you know, as new technology comes along, as new tools come along, that may change. Um, the nature of the project may dictate different types of organization. Uh, structures and different ways of doing things. We find we're working with clients, same thing. It's, it's you know, everybody has different ways of doing things. Um, but I think once you, once you're set on a certain path, you'll find what works best for you. And so in some cases like that, we're still refining stuff. And I think with the events in particular, like some of this is new exploration for us as well. Like we've got right. a lot of, lot of things to explore. We're doing some really cool new stuff for that. And I think that, um, I think that, uh, like we're figuring out how best to organize this. What are the best practices there it's funny too because it's like it's one thing to to say this is how we're supposed to do it it's another thing to get everybody you know including me to actually do that thing because sometimes doing that can be can take some time to set it up or to, you know to keep the discipline of keeping it all organized anyway um okay so i think at this point that's really covered the the bulk of uh kind of what i wanted to talk about in terms of virtual production how how we're doing these events how they're structured. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of stuff that takes place in the gameplay, and that needs to be uh, experimented with. And that's a lot of times our gameplay teams will go in and try different things, and we'll have a play test where we all look at the stuff every day, and we jump in, and we try it out, and look at it as a group, and uh, make comments about it or figure out what's working and what's not. But in terms of driving the overall experience, um, this is what we this is how we do it right now. And at runtime, basically, a certain time and um, this stuff executes, it kicks off, and it's just like an event system, uh, or a, like a blueprint type event that kicks off at a certain time of day, and it starts executing this, uh, this stuff. So that's, that's it in a nutshell. Uh, from here on, the rest of the stuff I'll be talking about are the nuts and bolts of how we go about doing some of the things in here um, in Sequencer. And most of these are, I'd say they're, they're kind of tips and tricks for doing complex stuff. Uh, in, in cinematics or in events, uh, in terms of how we use transform keys, you know, how we move stuff around in space, um, how we handle some things like curves, dealing with curves to make you know animations, simple animations look cool and smooth, um, and just a variety of other potentially useful things in the editor. So, if that's not your not your thing, then at least you know this is the part in the video. Where I'm Don't go tell them to leave. <laughs> it's going to be exciting. Oh, you'll probably learn. Yeah, if you do stick around, you'll probably learn some stuff, more stuff. Yeah. I mean, no, thanks for sharing that. It's yeah, great, yeah. great to get a little bit of, you know, see behind the scenes of such a large event and just get an idea of how it was created. Uh, so it's great. Yeah. All right. So, yeah, thanks, man. It's, I, I enjoy talking about this stuff, too. It's, it's fun. We're, you know, doing a lot of making a lot of progress in virtual production and bringing the real world and the virtual world closer together in ways. It's a lot of, a lot of cool opportunities there. It's a lot of fun. It's a really fun space to be a part of. Um, okay, so in here, let's look at the engine again. We're going to talk about transform keys. And I want to just show you, hopefully it goes from a little bit slow to more interesting as we go, go through this. So let the, I don't want to save that. We're gonna, okay, so basically what we're gonna look at right now is uh, different types of transform keys that you can use in Sequencer. I'll go pretty quickly through this if I can, but um, if you're not familiar with Sequencer, this, is, this should give you an idea of how we use some of this. Now this, these uh, transforms can be used on, like they're basically like animation tracks, right? They, they can be used on objects, simple objects, or they can be used on cameras. And uh, for, for layout people, usually you, you do a little bit of both. You animate things like a door that's opening, you know, if you want, you can do something like a door um, or a comet that moves through the sky. So for the uh, events, we move rocks, big rocks with these, um, either with splines or with uh, these transform tracks. 
Uh, you can update the character position. For example, when Travis teleports around uh, Fortnite, he's uh, we're, we're controlling a lot of that with uh, just simple move locational transforms where we're moving him through space. Um, we can also use that for effects as well. Uh, that we can, you know, depends on if we want to create a stuttering effect of the actor moving through space, we can do that with transforms. So let me open this up and show you some different types. Uh, these are all the different types of trans transform keys we have available to us uh, for basic animation in engine. Um, there may be some other stuff, but this, this is just the, the basic stuff you need to know. So right here, we're looking at cubic auto. Um, and all that is is just a type of key. These are all the transform keys here. Um, that shows you the trajectory of the object. See how it's smooth here? Um, that is, like when you use cubic auto, it basically takes that curve and automatically smooths it out. Simple, really simple. And so a lot of times, um, that's what I'll use. I'll select a bunch of keys and, and uh, just make sure that they're um, set to that value. Okay, so that that's the uh, that's the basics of cubic auto, and then uh, cubic user is something I'm just going to kind of almost skip past because I really don't use it that often. All that is is saying that it's a user specified um, curve. So mute that. In this case, uh, it becomes cubic user when I modify the curve from any of these other okay. default values. And that, as far as I know, if anybody knows differently, please let me know. But that's what I've I've kind of interpreted from, from working with for a while here. This is a classic case of user auto where I've created some crazy looking uh, curve. And that's just saying, and you can see the colors of the keys have changed here into blue, so it's not a default, basically, uh, or not, not a cubic auto. Um, and that's really, again, that's not something I ever, I, don't, I can't think of one case where I've ever specified that. Um, it's usually just something that will naturally occur. Is that could be Cuba's used? Break. I'll yeah. go ahead. No, please go ahead. I'm listening. No, I was just gonna say <clears throat> for those who are thinking that sequencer can only be used in terms of cinematics and virtual production, you can use the same tools to create one off animations of objects inside your game. And, and that would be one reason, perhaps, where you want to place the spline points um, manually or the transforms inside the level to maybe open a gate or. Um, oh yeah, like dude. I mean, we've done a ton of that, and I always uh, I laugh sometimes because we we'll get you know people that want to do super you know like they want to do a door animation in Maya, which is cool. I get it, and it makes sense in most cases, in many cases, um, especially if you're doing some really high fidelity thing that you're mm -hmm. you work faster than that. But a lot of times, if we just want to open a door, especially for gameplay type stuff, it's like we can do that in a few literally a few seconds. In yeah. Engine. Um, and you're done. And so you can do balls, you know, dropping if you want to, or rocks dropping. You can any any number of things you can animate with that. And so we'll also use it in terms of previs too, in terms of just very quickly getting the idea across of what an object's going to do. Um, if it's some really complex animation that we expect animation to eventually handle, we can at least stub it in in terms of timing and getting an idea of what's going to be happening. And we'll do that for events all the time. Where we'll take something that's going to be really complex and quickly get that in using using this, this technique here. But we also have final animation. For example, the planet in the end of the event, the Travis Scott event, that's all done in sequencer in uh, through transform tracks. One more. If you look, yeah. Sorry. Go one ahead. One quick question. Someone's wondering if it's possible to set the keyframe type per uh, frame or per transform key. Yes. So you yes, you can. You absolutely can. So um, it may have an effect on the overall system, but yeah, you can absolutely set that uh, per key. And I'll just go ahead and jump jump ahead here a little bit because I have a little tip um, that I just this is the, the way that I do things. But you can select any key and use one through five, the num keys one through five to set the different types, and they go like this: so cubic auto, cubic user, cubic break, linear, and constant. Constant will be five, key the key number five, and cubic auto will be one. Nice, um, good tip. So, yeah, and so those are the hot keys, and that's just that way you don't have to go searching through menus and stuff. In fact, I'm embarrassed to say I don't. If you ask me right now to find that in the menu system, I may not even know where it is. <laughs> probably, I could probably find it, but I don't know if you want to wait for me to go digging through stuff. But one through five is probably that's the tip for this section. Basically, is like this one through five is a quick way of setting that up. 
Um, but now that we're talking about that, let me just look. You can actually right click the, act, the keyframe and then you can manually set it here and, uh, if you want to, the, the uh, interpolation type. So you just click that and then set that. Okay, so cubic break is something I use quite a bit when we're going to do, if we need to have something have a little smoothing in and out, you'll notice that um, the line, the spline on this, you're able to adjust that, uh, basically flatten out that curve uh, for, for the, um, the spline. And that'll let, like right now, if I were to you, uh, click this, let's see if I, actually I'll have to go to three editor. It's kind of funny because when I try to explain this stuff, sometimes I'm, I do things that I don't even, I just do them automatically. I don't even know how I do them, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. It's kind of creepy, but um, for example, this is, let's see if I adjust this, Right now, that looks like it is set to auto. So if I wanted to break it, I believe I should be able to do my hot key thing works. Yeah, so I just uh, hit the hot yeah. key break. So it's cubic break. Now I can adjust that curve uh, independently. This is just to give a real good example. A lot of times when I first started working with this stuff, I was like, why the hell would you want to do that? Like, because I didn't come from an animation background. Uh, the reason why you want to do that is that you can create these really cool smoothing, uh, smooth curves that really mm -hmm. ramp up slowly over time. Because by default, it may look like this. And so this, see this little flattening down here? It means it should start more slowly and then well, it depends on your tra what transform or what you know um, vector you're going to be using. But it allows you to ramp things up and down uh, to, in time if you want to. So that's a really useful one, uh, especially it? for real... Mm -hmm. Is it also possible to edit the uh, spline directly in the 3D viewport? Uh, it is, but I haven't, to be honest, I haven't done it in years, so I really don't know where that lives. I think you'd have to show this, the spline viewport in here, under advanced, I think it's under advanced. Um, I'm not going to dig it into it here because it'll be a long, <laughs> it'll be a long me hunting, hunting it all down. I, I will say this, though. Um, and I'll get to this in a few minutes. When it comes to modifying curves, if I if I have a transform that's going to use a lot of curves in terms of something like kind of like this, where we want to do something complex, I'll usually transition over to splines because I feel like the tools for those are a little stronger these days. Okay. Um, although transforms are awesome, but I have an argument for using splines for certain types of animations, and that's actually part of this talk too. I can tell. Um, I'll go through just how to set all that up and how how we do that. Um, it kind of depends on what you're what you're trying to achieve, but in terms of visualizing the the handles on that, I haven't seen those in a while, so I have to go digging through it to, to probably find out where those are. Yeah, sounds good. I'm sure it's uh, might be covered in documentation as well. Cool. Um, okay, so the next one we've got cubic break. There we've got linear, um, and again, I use cubic break. Uh, for, I'll do it for a lot of fine tuning, tuning of camera movements or sometimes object movements, uh, because you really want something to kind of ease in slowly or ease out slowly. Disable that. Uh, under linear, okay, linear is obviously you can see how uh, how this is going to work. What is that? Uh, all moves at the same space, uh, same pace. So there's really no curvature to the to the motion at all. Uh, I find linear to be incredibly useful for a couple of things. Like number one, for very quickly blocking out cameras. If you're worried about a lot of weird curves and stuff, it just gets distracting. It's almost like I'll use linear to kind of get an image, uh, just the basic raw motion of the image without any curves on it, just kind of see where the camera is going to be going. Um, it's also useful for uh, moving objects through space at a consistent velocity. Uh, a lot of times you'll see, um, you know, people who are just new to animation or new to filmmaking or whatever it is. They'll do stuff that the motion, the motion just never looks quite right. It looks like you'll have something that really starts off slow that should have been moving at constant velocity the whole time. And you'll see it ramp up to its actual velocity. Um, I'll use basically linear keys for, for to get around some of that. So if you if you come into a shot and you want a car that's going through frame or you know, going through frame or, um, or a meteor or something that's going through frame or an event, like, a very easy way to do that is just through a linear linear track. So it always maintains a velocity as it's moving through frame or, or through the uh, virtual space. And again, I use these for a lot of uh, early camera work. And then I'll eventually convert those 
Um, so if I get this, let's just say this is the motion that I kind of the ballpark motion I want. I might select that and now go, let's turn that into something curved with the hotkeys there. And now we have a lot smoother motion. It looks less computer generated. And if I want to turn it back, I can do that. And that's also a good way to fix sometimes just to, to really look at the motion that you're getting. It looks like a screensaver motion, basically. Um, OK, constant keys, another one that I find to be really, really useful. And I'll just play through it really quickly. It basically pops things around to different locations. These are great for if you're into previs or you want to start blocking things out quickly. I say skip all the other key types and just move to popping things into frame or into space uh, where you want to see them. We used uh, constant keys uh, for the Travis Scott event all over the place. So when we wanted to have him teleport to a different location, we'd pop him to a new location. And then at that point, we'd then fill that, that motion in with effects. Um, that we had all kinds of velocity-based effects that would say, okay, if he changes his position velocity, it'll change the effects and stuff that he's playing. And that was um, that was how we handled a lot of lot of stuff like that. And again, I use that for I'll use constant keys for very quick quickly blocking out uh, previs for cinematics, sometimes for events. You can also this is kind of a little bit of a trick you can use. Um, if you do a lot of screenshots, one technique you can use, or if you're doing marketing content, for example, you can use Sequencer to store all the positions of your shots uh, through these constant keys. So you'd set up a camera and then save that position of the camera uh, in there. And so I'll, I'll do that sometimes if we're trying to get uh, some cool looking images out to marketing or, or just suggestive, like here's a concept, here's a concept image of something we could, we could put together. Cool. All right. So that that mostly covers. Um, I think that covers all the basic uh, transform keys there, or different types of things you may encounter. All right. So let's take a look at the three D graph. Curve curve editor here. Let me open up. All right. So again, I hope this is useful for everybody. I think that. Um, as I've gone through, you know, learning the technology here and using this tech, it's, I've had my own questions about, all right, what does this, what does this thing actually do? I may use it, and not even know what it does sometimes, and that's, um, you know, so I'm trying to like, like basically dig a little deeper into that in some cases, and so I think I feel like if I'm doing that, I bet a lot of other people that use this tool uh, might might find that useful. Also, if you're exploring using this technology for your company or for your production, I think it's worth knowing that capabilities are in there to do this type of thing. It's almost, almost always the first step is understanding the fundamentals will allow you to execute a lot better um, and also be able to communicate what you're doing a lot better. Because if you don't understand the fundamentals, then explaining what you're doing, as, as you've explained, can get a little bit difficult. Yeah. I mean, we had some students that we were working with recently that um, were learning all this stuff. And I was it was, it was a good thing for me because I was like, oh, man, I forgot. It's like I, I may do some of these things and not even know why I do them sometimes. Or It's always good to dig back into the technology and see what, what the nuts and bolts do. Um, but I find this knowing this stuff allows you to ultimately allows you to work much more effectively and faster. Some of these things in the past, either we, some of these are new tools. And like some of the stuff I'm going to show you right now, these are new tools um, that we didn't didn't necessarily have a lot of uh, in the past. And these will speed up our workflows in engine significantly so it went from being like ah it's kind of hard to do that in engine we just do it in maya but now or in another program whatever that may be um but now like we're increasingly getting some really cool tools that we can use uh in our cinematic and event uh, production pipelines okay so here um more exciting curves to look at we've got uh i basically want to time scale this object and so this is something we uh, we'll do pretty often. So let's we're going to look at the, the uh, curve editor here. Um, this is the way you can open. I don't know if you know this or not, but this like little curve thing here is how you open curve editor. Just open that up, and you can see here. If I select this time scale, it will show me all that. Um, now, if I wanted to like say scale this time, this curve, preserve this curve, and make it twice as fast. There's a couple ways of doing that. Well, like the, the uh, brute force method is to 
to go through and look at the math of it and say, okay, well, this key is going to fall half this time, or you could eyeball it, right, and not be very accurate, or you could do, the, do it mathematically and say, all right, I've got 119 or 120 frames, what's half of that? 60, and then what's a third of that? You, you know, come up with the math to, to create those numbers. Um, but the new curve editor has some really cool features in it that lets us do that very quickly. And so we're going to, we're basically, I'll show you how to time scale um, this curve uh, with a time scale tool. And let me also show you before I do that, um, there's a feature down here called Link Curve Editor Time Range. And this allows you to, uh, as you scrub in either one of these windows, it'll scrub your sequencer window. So you know, some people like it, some people don't. I don't mind it, it's not too bad. Um, I think I'll probably run with it uh, while we have it uh, on the screen here. But that's kind of useful. Otherwise, they'll be uh, async or, or they'll be out of sync. Mm -hmm. which is, which you, there's obviously there's cases where you do want that. But uh, in this case, we'll keep it on. All right, so up here, uh, we're in the 3D uh, sequence curves, sequencer curves editor. And we've got something called a retime tool, looks like a little stopwatch. And by default, it may come, come up like this, where you've got uh, these green lines. Um, if we're going to select the range that we want to, I'm going to try to be a little precise about this. So I'm going to close these down. The first thing I'm going to do is close down all the lines. So if there's a little X at the bottom you can close them down with. And now the screen is black. And you may actually, when you open it up with the engine for the first time, it may be, may be like that. Although I think there are some handles in there. To create a new time uh, coordinate, coordinate line basically just click on the keys you want to start with and then uh, the next place you click in here will be your time graph and then I put it a little bit to the uh, to the right of this just so it's easy and now I should be able to drag this let's see if I can do it now I can drag this um, into basically I drag the whole curve and it will time time scale that for me and so you see it moving it on the on the uh, sequencer down there in the sequencer window so that's just a really cool little tool uh, to retime things. I'm only showing you a, sim a simple curve. The, the real power of this, and a lot of these tools comes in to play when you're dealing with a lot of complexity. So say I have thousands of keyframes, and there's only a certain section that I want to retime and preserve all the other timing. Moving that manually is going to be impossible. Let me, let me just, I'll just show you this real quick too. Um, down here, like if you look at all these keyframes, like trying to do that mm -hmm. with, Manually with all those keys. Good luck. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I would. Impossible. Yeah. yeah. Right. So, so this is a, a really great tool for uh, navigating the complexities. And again, that's what the sequencer and tape recorder do really, you know, are intended to do really well is to help us as designers, developers, and artists uh, deal with increasing complexity in virtual production, in the engine, in, you know, in our projects. So that's what the tool is used for. Uh, let me disable that. All right, so that's the time scale tool. Again, it's up here. Close that. Uh, the transform tool, uh, I'll be honest, I don't really use it that frequently. Um, but there's some kind of basic cool things you can do with it. Uh, you can select things as a group and move them around. So if I wanted to move all this stuff around in space, I could do that. Uh, you can select, oops. You can also select um, individual curves. So let's go to this. I unmuted myself again there. So if you just wanted to move one, one curve, let's just say the Z value of that curve, the, the vertical value, um, you can move that around. And it moves, I believe it moves things based on a center, center origin. Uh, you can also do math here. So if I wanted to multiply the Upper bounds, which is the top. If I want to reduce that in half, I think it can multiply. Let's just see if it works. And I apologize if I screw this up because, again, I don't use that this often. Often, But our default value there was 500 so or 200, I think. So it basically reduces that. Um, but you can, move, you can move this stuff around and scale things with the transform tool. tool. And there's a lot of different features in there. We could probably do a whole Twitch stream on just all the different tool types here. Um, like uh, there's tons of different stuff in there, but I just want to kind of keep it simple. Mm -hmm. I'll say this: I'll use this trans. We'll probably use this transform tool in a few minutes when we're going to navigate some of the. Uh, we're going to move some of this VCAM data around to a higher position. We're going to take the Z value and move all that stuff up, and that's where that'll come into play. 
yeah, you can just select all this and you know do it kind of manually, but it's a lot easier if you see it as a block and you can move it based on that block. Okay. Um, and again, you'll, you should, I'll show you this in a few minutes, we'll look at it. All right, so scaling camera noise. So I've got, I've got some basic noise here. Um, I think I've got too many windows open. Just a second, close that down. Now I am getting really nerdy with this here. All right, cool. That's what we like. I know, I, I like it too. All right, so, uh, all right, so in here we've got, uh, I'm gonna show you how to scale down noise. And it's a little tool that we've got that lets you, man lets you visualize the scaling of, of stuff. This curve is kind of interesting and uh, it's using a post infinity cycle and I'll show you how to do that later on too in a few minutes. Uh, for now, that's why you're not seeing keys here. Um, I just wanted to keep it simple and just show you three keys. So let me go to, I'll basically select these three keys and let's go to uh, this little tool. So I, I call it scaling, basically scaling tool. And you can see it also has a center here. This is where the scale will occur from. So right now, if I were to, this will scale it up in value or down in value, same thing with the bottom this way or that way, it'll scale from that point where it is right now. So if I get out here and I'll just put it on the first key, it'll scale from that point and that'll keep it grounded on this plane. And so now I can just very quickly scale that up and down if I want to. Which is really cool. This is awesome for camera camera work if you're trying to fine tune camera, um, especially if you get into shakes, like camera shakes. You can do all kinds of cool diminishing or increasing camera shakes and control the the waveform uh, with with the scaling tool. And same thing here. And because this is a post infinity, it will continue continue on into infinity. I mean, it could be pre infinity if you wanted to, but I'll anyway. I'll explain that stuff later. So that's, that's that tool that's right up there. Um, let me show you how you can use the same thing for uh, an alternate version here. Okay, so here's the camera. You can see it, the constant shake there. And obviously the shake's pretty, pretty lame, but I just wanted to make it very clear can select this um, select these curves and let's start with uh, we we'll use the same tool and make sure the origin is in the right place and I'm just going to go through and I want to slowly reduce the curve height in in those curves and so I can just do this oops see I grabbed the, the reason that happened is the uh, point is up there on the top so I missed that little point right there, there we go. Same deal. This is the Bob Ross version. <laughs> cool. And it's just a very quick way of scaling that camera motion. So now if we look at it, we get that. And it's, I mean, in terms of just practicality, that it's pretty cool, um, especially if you're layering motion or if you want to do um, vibration shakes of some type or camera shakes, it's super useful. You get a big impact and then you just, you know slow fade off. Now, what I would probably do with this is, you know, much more complex, but the, that's the that's the core of it. Oh, it's like a bouncing camera now. Yeah, it's like a bouncing camera. <laughs> All right, um, mute this. All right, so I'm going to show you VCAM data, and I can, we already looked at this a little bit, but right now that is a bit can be a bit challenging to work with. Uh, because the amount of data that's there. VCAM is a tracking system, right? VCAM, yeah, it's a virtual camera, for iPad. Um, we can, in some ways, reduce this complexity if you want to, but this is what we get at the end of the day when, um, when we're out on the stage. The, or like here, for example, this is my cell phone, right? I can use mm -hmm. a cell phone for VCAM, and I can shoot, um, I can shoot the environment or character or scene shots, whatever, uh, and then record it with tape recorder. And this is the, the data that we're getting from tape recorder uh, when I do that. So that's actually all the transform keys from the virtual camera. That could be an iPad or, or a cell phone. And if you wanted to take this data and work with it a little bit, um, it may seem pretty daunting, but actually some of the tools that we have in here, 
um, are pretty useful for that. So let's start by looking. The problem with this one right here is that it's, it's on the ground. It's super low. So I'm going to see if I can live adjust this. And I apologize if I screw this up because I really haven't. This is like me working live, basically. I haven't really practiced this. So let's see if we can do this. Um, we'll get a Z value because like, we want to adjust the height of the thing. And I'm going to select all that. And now I'm going to go to that transform tool that we had. All right, let's see if I can pick this thing up. All right. Now my settings are pretty low, so let me zoom out a little more. But you can see what I'm doing here, basically. Yeah, yeah, it's clear. Okay, all right. So that that's that's what we're looking at. Um, cool. All right, so now I've kind of, let's just say I fixed the camera. Mm -hmm. um, and let's play it back. All right, so we're... Or at least we're not on the on the ground anymore. At least we're a little little higher, still kind of low, but that's fine. Um, so that's that's how we, I might use the transform tool, just grabbing everything and sliding it up. Um, you can also lock the axis um, so you only go you know only move along a single axis. So if you don't want to slide data left or right, I would just enable that. Okay, so the next part of this is looking at all these transform keys here. Um, that is a lot of data, right? And so I'm going to simplify that and get it down to something that's manageable that I can then keyframe. Now, I'm not going to do a bunch of keyframing here. I just want to show you this filter. And this is part of what I'm trying to show, show everybody here. So we've got all these keys, um, huge amount of data. Let's get rid of that. If you go over here, there's a uh, filters section. And this gives you all kinds of cool stuff you can do. I say that, but honestly, I don't use <laughs> use them that often. I think Simplify is the one that I'll use the most, and I've used it on most every project that we've worked on uh, in some capacity or other, whether it's for um, a camera or for some other uh, curve that we're trying to simplify. So you select Simplify, uh, set your tolerance. I believe the higher the number to, towards one is preserves current, and the lower the number uh, goes into less data, I think, or is it maybe it's flipped. Let's see what happens. So we'll hit Apply. OK. And so that's significantly reduced the number of keyframes. And these, some of these are a little, little, a little challenging to work with. But overall, um, that, that would allow me to go in and modify these curves uh, with reasonable accuracy without, without having to modify hundreds and hundreds of keys. And so if I needed to, I could, you know, get rid of this, clean some of this up. And you could, like, usually what I'll do, and I won't do it here, is I'll play with this value quite a bit to see where the curves change. And surprisingly, sometimes even, you know, less complexity is more accurate to the final curve. So you just have to play with those values. But long story short, this allows you to go in there and clean uh, a lot of that stuff up. And now I can probably work with these curves, um, especially if you look at them in isolation, some of them, like that one. Like that would be a lot, lot easier to work with than this other one. And you can also do that per curve. So I should be able to select, um, let's see if we can find, all right, that one. I should be able to go in, oops, hit the key there. I should be able to go in and plug in a new value there. Let's do something high, let's see what that does. Yeah, okay, so actually the higher it goes, the more it filters it. Um, and now that's super simple. Now that may not have preserved exactly what we want, but I just have to play with the value. It's, so that's how we use that, that tool. Uh, super useful and probably very useful for you if you're gonna be doing stuff with VCAM or wanna do a little hybrid where you got a little VCAM, but you need to modify it just a little bit for your, your uh, purpose. Okay. Um, let me take a look here and just see if I missed anything. I yeah. think I got most of that. I think we're I think we're pretty good uh, in terms of all the stuff that I wanted to cover for that. I'm going to go ahead. Did you have any questions, Victor? Or no. We well, I was going to say we have about half an hour left, and that would include a. I do want to get through a couple of the questions that have come in as well. Just give okay. me an idea of the time. Yeah. So just let's see. We've got uh, additive tracks. Talk about splines, attached tracks and some useful tips. So it's four different things. That'll probably go a pretty long time. So if there's something in there uh, that you guys you know, want to hit on particularly, let me know. I think the splines are usually pretty pretty useful. Um, if, anything, if, if we were just going to cover one topic, I'd probably cover that. I'd say you're the professional here, so I'm going to let you think 
Um, okay. One might be the most important thing. All right, that's, that sounds good to me. All right, so we're, we're going to do one thing before we jump to spline since we have it open. Mm -hmm. uh, here we have got uh, added layers. This is incredibly useful for if you're doing camera work in the engine uh, manually. Let's grab over this. Unmute this. And what this is, is um, it gives us the ability to add transform layers on top of each other. And this is great. Uh, in the past, we were not able to do this. You had one transform track or one you know, set of data that you could animate. And if you wanted to get really complex motion, it became very difficult because you didn't have multiple layers of animation you could add on top of each other. Um, we now have the ability to add additive transforms. And I use this all the time to create very complex cameras very, very easily uh, in engine. And so all it is, is by default, um, you, you know, all tracks will have, or most tracks, especially camera tracks, will have one transform track that you see, see here on this top level. Um, and this will be your animation, uh, basic, basic animation. You can also add uh, by simply selecting that transform and doing additive. Um, that will give you, and I don't want to go into the details of these elements because they're going to take too long to explain, but um, for, for just practicality, like just if you want to get something done really fast, try this out. Uh, try using the additive tracks, and you can keyframe stuff on different, um, different levels. It allows you to very quickly um, add layers of motion to things. So I think this one, this layer just uh, controls, I'll just call it layers basically because that's what it is. I believe that controls tilt. So I had a camera motion, and say if this camera was, for example, say it was the VCAM, right? All that VCAM data that we were just looking at. Um, if you wanted to move that through space uh, with on one transform track, forget it. You'll never do it because it's it's so it would have to you'd have to be so complex to get that all right. Um, this is great because now you just add one tran uh, one additive track, and then you can literally transform that whole system through space uh, with a very simple uh, a few keys. So I recommend experimenting with this a lot if you can. Um, you can adjust this, you know, however you want. But that's we just call that, you know, our additive layering system for for our transform tracks. And again, just so you know where it is, uh, just go in here and under transform, let's just add a new layer, additive, and then let's let's do a vertical motion on this one. Yes, you could do this in any of these other ones, but I would I like to sometimes separate them out so I know specifically what they're doing. Do this. Okay, and then we'll do a let's just do a lift up. It may look kind of funny, but that's all right. So now we've just added another layer of motion on there. And again, very useful for really complex. If the top layer is super complex in terms of keyframes and stuff, this is great. Great way to quickly get results. Um, with complex stuff. And it's almost a non-destructive uh, workflow too, right? Yes. Yeah. The danger, the danger, so it's awesome, not destructive exactly. You can remove the stuff if you want to, do whatever you want with it. The problem is, um, I find, is when you hand, if you hand this stuff off to somebody and they've mm -hmm. never seen this stuff before, it's like, all right, where's all this motion coming from? Now you have to go through all that. Uh, you can bake these tracks down. So let's see. Um, you can bake these tracks down to be a single transform again. And let me, I'll just do it live here, see if I can do it live. Bake transform. Oops, I clicked the wrong one. There we go, let's do bake. Or maybe I won't do it live. Maybe I have to look into that a little more. <laughs> uh, actually, let's see, I think it's this one. Bake transform, there we go. All right. Um, so yeah, that bakes it down to a single transform track. Okay. Now, obviously, it's got uh, a lot of keys now, but you can still use what I would do, and this works very well. Is you grab this data and then you go to your curve editor. Well, I'm having some little click problems here for some reason. Okay, we go to the um, curve editor, and then now we can select all that data, and we can simplify it. We go over here. And let's do a simple reduction. Simplify and we'll just do 0.1 again to make sure we save it. 
And then now that's workable, right? Anybody can work with that. Um, so if you if you need to if you want to use the additives and then you need want to send it out to outsourcing or send some other department, it's a very easy way to, to get rid of a lot of the, the complexity there and get it back down to one transform track. All right, let's jump to um, I'm going to get work jump to splines because this is some cool stuff. And this is really kind of important for events because this gets into uh, complex motion and especially for previs. Now, just as a general note, we uh, use splines to uh, control objects in terms of the path of an object. These could be uh, points of light. They could be rockets. They could be anything you want moving through space. I think the important thing to remember is that because it's a spline and you get all these crazy, you can do all kinds of crazy curves. I find it much easier to work with this type of motion uh, in a spline versus in a transform key. Um, also, one of the advantages is you can um, you can see the splines all at the same time. And if you, I think, if you select them, let's see. I'll probably mess this up. Basically, you can see everything at the same time uh, when you're working. The problem with some of the transforms you have to have it clicked on. To see, you know what I mean? Like with the mm -hmm. uh, transform actors, you have to have uh, the act clicked on, and then you can see the actual arc. And the, this allows you to, to see all the paths of all the objects if you want to at the same time. And there's an option in here. I don't want to dig into too far, but it's, uh, it allows you to show splines, and that should all these splines should show up uh, during the game. So if you need, it's great, for example, we had an event where a lot of rockets came out. We had rockets going everywhere. <laughs> it's like, we wanted to know, we want to make sure these two rockets didn't, inter, you know, didn't collide in the air. And like, there's one way, of, the two ways of doing that. One is just to watch the scene and make, you know, keep adjusting and stuff, which takes forever. Or we just show all these splines and say, oh, this, these are the, all the paths these objects uh, take. And so uh, that's what we use the splines for. Complex motion of objects through the scene. And also, um, cameras and these are great awesome for fly throughs or if you have a shot for example cinematic where you have a really highly complex camera move what i would probably do is use the the spline system a camera rig rail system i'll show you how to add it here in a second and uh, use that plus additive layers of camera motion so you'd use this to drive the mo the main trajectory of the camera and then use transform uh, transform layers to do some other subtle stuff for the camera and you can do some pretty wild shots that way, um, long single shots. I think the longest camera move I've done with one of these is like a minute long, something kind of kooky like that. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's uh, that's the rail system there. And if you haven't worked with this, let's start from the ground here. So uh, cinematics, they if you go over here in the uh, placeable actors uh, category over here, you can do um, the cine camera, camera with rail, camera crane, uh, you just drag this into the scene and you can quickly begin building a spline. Pull this up, you just select the nodes, pull them out. I'm holding alt, so I have the alt key down and I think it's left, left mouse and I can pull these out and spline points will start to move. I'm, I could just grab a handle on the spline by the way. So let me show you that. So if you click any of these points, you'll see the handle. And this is kind of one of the, when we had a question earlier about uh, this on transform tracks, I find these to be extremely easy to work with um, in terms of visualizing all this. And you can change these, you can change the uh, transform type as well. Uh, if you right click, there's a myriad of options you can set on these. Uh, spline point type, this curve, linear, okay. constant. but there's a ton of other options that you can set in here. You can visualize roll and scale. And that's, all that. that's the same case for the regular spline actor, right? I think so. I think so. This is mostly like obviously, obviously, this has a mesh associated with it, mm -hmm. um, and this is kind of part of the cinematics thing. But I usually like to get rid of all that. There's a mode you can actually just see the spline in. Um, but yeah, so that's that's basically how you you add a spline. And now, if you want to attach, like I'll show you how you attach something to that next so um let's just do that live take a sphere i'm gonna, I'm gonna attach the sphere to the spline 
and I will go into details. First thing I need to do is make sure that this thing is not static, which it is by default because it's a static mesh. Let's switch to movable. Great. And now the world outliner, I will drag that over the camera rig rail. Actually, which one is it? Let's just say that one. I may have got the wrong one here, but that's all right. It doesn't matter. I'll, we'll see in a second. So I'm going to select that sphere, and then I'm going to details panel, and I'll zero that out. Now, there it is. It's on this spline. Sorry, guys. Sorry, everybody. Um, that, yeah, that basically attaches it to the spline, and now um, you can drive it along that spline. The, uh, I'm, I'm jumping around. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm this, this part of the, there's a lot of, a lot of stuff we can talk about here. Um, so on the, the camera rig rail, let's look at this one in particular. We've got this ball uh, attached to it. Same method we did. We just attached it to the, mm -hmm. to the, to the, um, to the rail. And it's got a value between zero and one. It used to be a long time ago we had, you know, any number of, like it was the float, a wild float fest up into, you know, huge numbers, the length of the overall rail. And now we've simplified it. Um, and so this, this is just between zero and one. So it keeps everyone simple to do. But basically... Uh, current position on rail means the start, so that's one, the value is one, and then we're going down to the value of zero. Let me just go hide all this other stuff. Okay, yeah, so that's the actor moving along the rail, and you can see it in time here, and then you can scrub it. And again, we'll do this with rockets and all kinds of stuff to, to get some cool stuff going we did this with the uh some of the asteroids and or some of the uh, rocks that were flying up in the sky for the Travis scott event and some other things that were moving around uh the island with, with um with the splines here you're using the uh, g key to toggle the vis of the splines on and off right yeah mm -hmm. that's right and and uh, again, there's an option that lets those, even in game mode, lets you see them. And I'm, I'd have to dig down through here, but I believe it's the splines option. Uh, if you look over here, uh, when you add these splines, so you just, if you want to do this all in sequencer, you basically just drag, uh, you create your spline and then add it in here, just like you would an actor. Let's just, just add this one over here so you can see the process. Right? And you can just add it there, and then you'd add um, your your uh, object that you want to, you know, same setup there, and then attach it. And then in order to animate that, let me show you these, the camera rig rail, you have um, a current position on rail right here, and that'll add a keyframe for that. Like if this doesn't exist, let's just do this. If I add this, it adds that um, track for me. So now I can animate that, and then you can just specify wherever you want that to go. So we'll start off at one, and then we'll end up at zero. Yeah, anyway, but you, I think you get the idea, right? Yeah. Okay, cool. So it should, yeah, now it's moving. Okay, so that's, it's really simple. Same thing with the camera. Uh, you will add a camera onto the, to attach it to the rail and zero it. The first thing you do is just zero that out. And the, I don't know if you, if you all have seen this before, but um, I find this to be incredibly useful too, is that you can grab any object and say you have some weird value here, a bunch of weird values. You can just use this um, reset the default button and then it'll snap things back to, back to zero or back to the default values. Um, and so, the, so you do that to basically mount these uh, things on rails. Let me delete some of this so we're not some crazy stuff I'm seeing. Uh, there's another feature. Uh, and this is useful for uh, certain types of cameras and for projectiles, trajectory stuff that you want to move through space. There is a uh, option called, um, let's see where it is. This. Lock orientation to rail. And that means it, it will take the forward vector of the rail and lock the orientation of the object to that forward vector. And it always keeps it like, so it's great for spaceships or something, something along those like lines. Like a roller coaster. Rocket or roller coaster, exactly. It just keeps you right along the rail. The problem sometimes, it depends on the rotation of things. Your offsets may be, you know, all kinds of different rotations. So you just, if you're having problems with that and you want to keep something like in the direction of the rail, use that um, lock orientation to rail. And we'll use that for cameras, for, especially for fly-throughs, where you want to make sure that camera is always just going along the, uh, the path of the spline. 
Now let's see what this is. Yeah, I think I think that's mostly it for the for the basics of the spline. Um, I don't think I have too much more to show there. I guess I could show you the the orientation. So let me jump over and show you one other thing here. Then splines, and this is where it gets kind of interesting. Attachments, okay. Uh, this part, uh, how are we doing on time, Victor? Are we good? Uh, we minutes? got we got ten minutes, but we can push it a little farther to make sure that we get the questions in at the end. So, okay, I, Go ahead. I'll just it's good of, stuff. I'll breeze through here. So, this I was going to show an attachment hierarchy here of how we set everything up. Long story short, I'm not going to get into a ton of detail about this, but we uh, generally speaking will try to have a central origin actor that we attach all the stuff to the camera, the rail system, the light, uh, the chair, everything, so we can move it all together as one piece. And there's a couple ways to do that. You can do it through the, the uh, world outliner here, or you can do it through um, sequencer, through spawnables. And there's a whole way of doing that um, through an attached track. Now, although I could just literally drag it onto the onto these, uh, or I can literally drag these things onto the origin in here, if they're spawnable, you can't necessarily do that um, and get all the attached tracks. So you can add, I'm just going to do one example of this. I'm going to add an attached track here. So we do attach. And then you can specify what the thing you want to attach to is. In this case, we want to attach it to the origin. And now, if I move this origin around, the, uh, the track will move with us. Okay, so that was one thing I wanted to show with attachments. And the other thing I'd like to show you really quickly here, and this is a really powerful tool. See this like perfect rail here, um, the perfect circle? Uh -huh. Uh, that's a great, it can be a very cool camera move where you take a camera and you move it around, you know, uh, object in, in space. And if you do it perfectly, it looks, it can look pretty cool. So we now have the ability, this is the last thing I'll, I'll talk about here. Um, I'm gonna, I just dragged a regular camera rig rail into the scene. I'm going to delete the first, the, or the second node and make sure that we only have one node left. I'm going to right click that and I'm going to... Uh, go to spline this is new spline generation panel right so open that up and i can specify what i want so let's do a circle and it'll automatically generate that circle for me and then i can say the number of points on that circle which is be eight for now let's do the radius the 300 and now we've got a pretty nice looking um rail that we can work with that is awesome Another... yeah it's awesome right? i'm familiar with that that new menu actually could you real quick see if that is if the same one exists on a regular spine actor? Um, yeah. How would I like? Where where would you want me to try this? You can find it there. Yeah. Spline mesh actor. Let's see. Okay. Close that. Now, oops. I don't. I don't think. Yeah, I'm unable to click on that. Wonder it may be possible. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, don't worry. I'll dig into that. I, I was just um, okay, cool. getting interested. Yeah. It may be, may be I would think because it's, um, as far as I know, it's the same code, right? Mm -hmm. but, um, or should be, I think. But the other part of this is that you can at any time add more components to that. So if you wanted to use arc, square, like, <laughs> you know, square is interesting if you're doing something very robotic, but, um, but you can basically do a series of very complex curves and stuff very quickly on any of these nodes and add, they can be additive. So that's, that's something really cool to experiment with and very useful for events, whether you're doing cameras or you're doing uh, animation of objects through space. Um, we didn't get to a, a few things here. I had a lot of tips and tricks, but maybe that'll be for another stream. I hope I'll be able to get you back on the stream. That'll be, yeah, I'd love to, I'd love to. <laughs> Yes. All right, so that's that's mostly what I have today. All right, all right. Let's uh, go ahead and dig through some of the questions then. And I'm sure there will be more things just for you um, to talk about, maybe even throw in a little tips and tricks there. Um, earlier from the beginning when we were sort of talking a little bit about um, the motion capture stage and such, um, yeah. so I was wondering if it's possible to stream Vibe Trackers into UE4 Live. Um, yeah, so we like if I'm hopefully I answer this correctly. Yes, we use live trackers uh, in a number of different things. We can put a live tracker on the back of this iPhone, right, and or an iPad, and we can live track that. Uh, we can 
then track this device with that for, for accurate coordinate space. In fact, that's what we'll do oftentimes. Um, the AR kit stuff is awesome, very cool, but if you want um, even more accuracy in some cases, um, in, in you know weird lighting conditions, whatever, you can absolutely use uh, a via puck um, on the back of things. We also used it for the 2018 real-time live SIGGRAPH demo with the Star Wars folks, uh, where we had a uh, XN suit, physics suit on our stage, uh, stage at the, at the venue. And one of the problems was at the time, uh, over time, we might get a little bit of drift in the system. And because we were in VR, uh, we had two people in multi-user in VR interacting with each other. Uh, we really could, couldn't have any drift at all. So what we did is we came, came up with a system to attach two Vive pucks to the actor around their waist one in the front, one in the back. And uh, in blueprints, we got an average of those two, loca two locations of uh, a point in space that we then said, this is like the, the root of, of this actor. And so if the, if the suit drifted, if it happened to drift, um, we would say, nope, correct back to this point, And then that would keep everything locked. And so that was a really awesome solution for, um, you know, a really useful so solution for, uh, for any problems we had with, with um, any type of drift or anything like that yeah rem again, removing it yes yeah, excellent seats awesome too we use it all the time this is another question um, yeah. um they were wondering if the setup on the mocap stage was a vicon setup and if we use the rocker co suits as well um i don't i don't know uh, exactly the latest uh, hardware i know we use i believe it is vicon um but we also have we have pretty much everything at different stages we use di different uh setups at different stages I don't know about the suit though. That one I, I'm not familiar with. Is it possible to do multiple remote motion capture sessions live? Multiple remote capture sessions? I believe sessions. they mean, so say we yes. have one actor over in, in Raleigh and we have another one in LA and we're now in a multi-user session and there's a mocap suit mm -hmm. Raleigh, one in LA. They're both acting in a multi-user session and being able to record that. Yeah, absolutely. I get that, yeah. Um, I have, we haven't, as far as I know, I personally have not done that. Knowing what I know about the system, I wouldn't yeah, I don't, be surprised. I don't see a reason why that. you'd be able, yeah. why you wouldn't be able to do that. Um, Cause yeah. they will still be streaming in all their data um, yeah. to the server. I mean, for example, here's a quick example of something too, that's not so much different is that we're in a multi-user session. We have two operators, one's in California, two camera, let's say two camera operators, operators. one's in California, one's here in Raleigh. Uh, we're both using V cams in the same session, shooting like I'm shooting from one angle, another guy shooting from another angle, covering the action, and so we have two camera operators across the country uh, working in multi-user together, getting shots, and that we know that works, so that you know that's okay. Yeah. Uh, they were curious, so production time from high level concept to rolling on the larger team. Uh, can you say what the larger team size was? and a rough idea of the total production time. This is in refer, uh, referring to the Travis Scott event. Sure, sure. Uh, production, so team size, um, I don't know how much of this is like, you know, we can really talk about it, but um, I, as far, like, I'll just give you general, general ballpark-ish type ideas. So we start off with a very small team of people, um, really just like five or six people in terms of just doing some of the basic groundwork for it. Mm -hmm. And then at some point uh, that team grew into, I'd say, Full production, maybe 120 people, uh, but that's unusual. And that was because there were some little things that we were trying to do very, very quickly. Um, I think that most of the, the team size floated around 15 to 20, I think, something, something like that. Could be wrong. So I, uh, I'm, that's kind of a guess. Um, but most of the meetings that I've been in, it's not you know not tons and tons of people. It's usually a pretty small group. In terms, if you wanted, if you want to do something like that uh, at your studio, we've talked to some people about that, and it seems like my 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 feeling is that if you have people who know Unreal and how to use Unreal, I think you could do some really awesome stuff. And I don't personally, I don't think it's that hard to do in Unreal. I think a lot of the tools that we have make it pretty easy to do that, um, and I think it really starts to come down to the quality and the quality of the art and the artists that you're using and their knowledge of uh, technology, and I think that's where it starts to to, to um, could, you know, could go one way or the other. And I think right. that's really the, the big thing. But the and, tools themselves let, let you do it pretty easily. And in this case, you had, you know, the Fortnite world and a lot of assets 
already, you know, that you could use for the event, which is different if you're setting up a, a an event from scratch where you'd need a bunch of artists to create all yeah. the art for you. Or or you get creative, you know, and that's the problems we face as well. Like even though we're a big studio and have a lot of employees and a lot of firepower, um, there's a lot of like unknown situations we run into and not in Fortnite necessarily, but other special projects or other things that we're working on that they're like, there's no, there are no assets for it. And like, now we've got to get creative about how we do things or we don't want to do dialogue for something. Now we have to do it all visually. And so some of that's just problem solving, mm -hmm. um, figuring out. And it's, I know that can be very challenging. Uh, but very often but, limitation also leads to very interesting design. Um, yeah, exactly. I, I remember there's uh, something I read a while back about uh, Japanese architecture, which is beautiful. And that there were a lot of limitations in Japan for development. And some of, the, some of that beautiful architecture came out of all those restrictions and limitations, which I thought was kind of cool. So yeah, absolutely. It's another, uh, time... good, it's another good talk from um, the coalition on Gears, how they designed some of the characters due to accessibility and how it became like a really uh, loved and well-playing character uh, in Gears 5. Yeah, that's yeah, kind of cool. Um, and then on time a time scale, uh, we had some breaks in between. So I think we were, um, I think like two, maybe two, three months, something like that, I think. And, but that's with some time factored in there. Um, so it seemed, it seemed, to us, it seemed pretty long. But I, again, we had all kinds of stuff in between that. Mm -hmm. I think, I think, could be wrong about that, but I think that was something like that. Someone was curious if it's possible to use the iPad's camera to get a real-time camera feed inside Unreal for live compositing. So I'm not gonna. I'm gonna. I'm gonna actually won't answer that because I don't know all, all of our capabilities with compositing. That's one area of virtual production that I don't work on regularly. My understanding is that we like if you look at the, um, you know, some of the things like I think the Mandalorian, or you know, for, for we have all kinds of uh, cool stuff we can do with compositing. So unfortunately, I can't answer that um, as well as I'd like to. But I do know I do know this is that we can obviously get our virtual cameras working with you know, iPads, but we can also visualize other cameras through that if we need to. Okay. We can't get other, other views, I believe. But I, some of that may be special, you know, one-off type stuff. I would um, maybe that's the question we can get back to somebody else too, if it's yeah. possible. To do. Yeah. Uh. If I already keyframed my camera actor, can I use VCam to record keys on top of it? If you've already keyframed your your camera and you want to use yes, you I mean so in theory what you could do, um, well kind of. You can play back your camera and you can overwrite that data with your VCam, right? But you could also potentially do a layer of shooting the VCam and then putting your other camera underneath it in terms of an additive track or vice versa, where you're layering your uh, VCAM data over. Let me tell you about how I would do that or why I might do that. So um, a lot of times I'll have a simple camera move that goes from A to B. Let's just say it's a, a camera that pushes in. And on that path, I want to create a shake. Um, I can either do it, like say I want a steady shake on it. I might record this VCAM and then uh, add that motion as an additive layer to the camera so that we see that camera moving forward as an like that or we could do an impact where i just take this and i shake it like crazy and so as that camera's moving through space we also have an explosion or something that goes off and then the camera shakes at the same time as that and continues on down its path um, so yeah you can you can add things that way in terms of blending the transforms all together um, it's not something i've done but i do use that example you know occasionally and you can Funny thing, you can actually use an HMD for the same purpose. Yeah. Yeah, which is cool. Yeah, because you can add the uh, motion controller or camera component um, and record that transform in sequence there as well. It's actually how I used to do uh, tutorials for some of the VR games I worked on. I actually just recorded myself as one of the players uh, in yeah. sequence there and then played myself back um, uh, at runtime. And yeah, you can also. You we're using a tape, so we're using tape recorder uh, a lot for that type of stuff. Where we just just to make that very clear too, you can just grab any actor in the game and stick it in tape recorder and hit record. And so you could do your V cam or your headset. And it used to be sequence recorder, so that was also possible mm -hmm. in the past. 
that's a whole other discussion, the difference between those two different things. But yeah, yeah. I, I did want to mention that you can also record a microphone directly into sequencer. And so if it's useful for you to have that sort of previous of the actor, if, if um, actually sort of speaking or saying things or making noise and record that on the same timeline as all of the transforms, it can be super useful to have that, um, that information when you then go to actually uh, to do the real audio track. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Um, and we do it, you know, pretty often we'll record to know where we are in the timeline or even sometimes for like, if we're not running with, with time code, we're running outside of time code and all, all the synchronization that happens there, we just want to run quick and dirty. We'll just, we can do a class and then mark, mark certain things based on that. But, and time code, uh, yeah. would you, would you mind explaining what time code is? Yeah, sure. So a very kind of surface look at that is that we have um, all these devices. So in this image here, you can see all this stuff here. All these devices, not all of them, but a lot of them, um, as we're recording, will have um, time. Basically, they're, they have a, a time, right? And time code is like, this is like, just say it's one to zero to 10 seconds, right? And we want to make sure because of latency, because some of these things are falling on different, uh, because they take longer, like their signal takes longer to get back into um, the, basically all, like everything doesn't process at the same speed. So what we do is we have time code that says at this exact piece of time, like at the five second mark, all these devices were on that, uh, that five second mark time. And that gives us the ability to make sure everything's synchronized um, so we can pull in different pieces of time code and make sure all those time code pieces are aligned. So we know that all these things are happening on the same frame at the same time. And that gets really, um, that gets really important the more technical you get with virtual production. How we roll oftentimes on a daily basis, depends on the type of virtual production shoot. Just we, like I say we, I say one of the teams that I'm working on, just one of them, um, we roll pretty loosely and we don't always roll with time code. If we want to get everything, if we want to make a cinematic on this stage and get the camera and get the animation and get the audio and everything all at the same time and basically make it pretty much the final product or very like a few few minutes away from the final product, then we will use time code to make sure we have everything in sync and everything's aligned and there's no uh, question about things being off. And so that's that's basically time code. It just makes sure all these different devices, I, I think that's my explanation of it, could, uh -huh. be, could be wrong, but but it's basically making sure that all these devices are on the same beat, same piece of time. Could you read time a whole sequence or subsequence instead of just a single curve or a set of curves? Um, could you read time a whole sequence? So yeah, I mean, you can like, just for a general answer, um, you, could, you could apply a time scale to, to the entire sequence. So you could use a couple of different ways you could do that. One is you could use the tool that I showed you with the uh, time scaling tool. That may that'll account for transforms or key based uh, animations or key based things. It may not account for um, the animation tracks. Animation tracks you'd have to do that manually, where you select the track and you can right click the track and set its play rate for the time, which is really cool because um, sometimes, like in a normal cinematic where we have everything playing at one speed. I might want to slow down the animation and like we did for the Travis Scott event mm -hmm. where when we play that animation back um, in some cases for, from one of the actors or for like the, the skulls that were you know, running, like walking around on the seabed in the water, like their, their play rate was slowed down to 0.667. And so that was just, just slow them down in that se sequence. And it's really cool. Another thing you can do, um, we do have a track that globally time scales everything. So, it will time scale all the cameras, all the effects. It basically puts into like bullet time or slow motion, um, and that affects everything globally. Um, and then you can also some some actors, for example, an effect system, you can select um, and say what type of play rate you want them to have uh, individually in the engine. And that can be useful sometimes where you want everything playing at normal speed, but you want, say, for example, a fire effect to play just a little bit slower so it feels more weighty and heavier. Um, so does that, did that answer the question, do you think? I think so. There are many different ways to do it. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, and yeah, like a few good sure. examples, so I'll, I'll say so. Um, okay. How do you handle this toggle, so visibility toggle tracks uh, for skeletal mesh bones or component meshes? 
So for components and bones, so I personally, I don't really do a lot of uh, hiding of bones. Usually we'll do collapses uh, in some cases where we just want to collapse the bone down into like into a tiny, a tiny scale. scale at zero, right? Yeah, but this, that may be the non-official answer that I'm just saying like in the field. Um, because uh, honestly, we have specialist departments that will do some of that stuff um, when we're working on these big events. Uh, in terms of hiding components and those type of things, uh, I believe we should be able to, to uh, although I, honestly, I haven't done that for a while. Usually I'll just hide the entire actor, but I believe we can hide the component sequencer as a created component track for that and then hide that. Okay. Hide Another way I but, thought it was to actually call a blueprint event and then manually do it um, as a function on that event. Um, yeah, absolutely. That'll work um, where you, and just for people to understand, like, yeah, you just create an event track and then you uh, link that event, create a keyframe for the event and then link that event to a blueprint script that then executes on the blueprint actor. Um, or if you're a level sequence, it's a little more complicated if you're going from a uh, sequencer to a level sequence or to the to the level blueprint versus an actor blueprint. Actor blueprints are super easy to interface with. And so, I, Victor, I think that's probably a, a, a solid, solid work. I, I know for a fact that works. And then you can experiment with all kinds of logic right there, even before you implement it in a track, if you feel that workflow is uh, works works better for you. Yeah. Um, the cinematic, the cine camera does not have data for T stops. Most of all production cameras slash lenses uses T stops. Will we see this in cine cameras anytime soon? I don't know. Um, I know that. Well, I think as far as I know, our like our V cam stuff is is being uh, improved. So I don't know if we'll see anything out of that. Um, but as far as I know, I don't know. I don't know that I've heard anything about that. See if we can follow up. Uh, I don't even know what a T stop is, so. I'll, I'll say this. I don't, I don't know if this is useful at all. It may, may or not be, but you can, like, so we have two, two basically two different types of cameras. We have uh, a cinematic camera and the virtual or the legacy Unreal camera. And one of the problems we run into, this is a little different, but one of the problems you run into is that people are always trying to, I say people, me, I'm trying to sometimes convert uh, what a film, like what film back we're using on that legacy camera because it's, it's like all FOV based, right? And then you've got an actual film back on the cine camera. And you can use, um, in the cine camera, there's something called HFOV. And it gives you, as long as you're in the same aspect ratio, you can grab that value, HFOV value, and plug that into um, your legacy camera and as an FOV. And that'll let you match up those camera types. And so we'll use that. I think we use that sometimes for, uh, or I've used it for <sighs> different, different, um, scripty type stuff to make sure that cameras like a, a game camera goes through the proper uh, has this pro proper aspect ratio and film back as a cinematic camera uh, so anyway that's something you might be able to look into we'll take all the tips and tricks that you're able to share to us <laughs> okay all right <laughs> um there was a question in regards if we have plans to do a tutorial or a live stream uh, using Control Rig, and this is a question for me. Yes, in fact, I have scheduled it for the last Thursday of July. So um, in just about a month and five days, we are doing a uh, live stream on how to uh, work and operate with the Control Rig sample uh, project that you can actually download from the, from the Epic Games launcher already. And so that's in the works. And then my last question for you, Grayson, today, we're, we're out of time, a little bit over, but I think it's, right. it's been great to have you on and sharing all this information. Uh, someone was curious, what is the biggest challenge right now in virtual production? Ooh, that's a big question. Um, I think, um, I think getting it all to work, you know, real time is, is honestly like we're getting final pixels out in some cases, but I think getting, getting that all like making it what it could be, you know, really what it would like, where it can go, um, where everything's fine. You know, you're out there, for example, like the ideal situation is that we all go to the stage that you see in this image here mm -hmm. and we shoot some stuff and we play around some lights and put everything together and we're done. And we're a hell of a lot closer to that than we have been in the past. Um, and I think that that's the challenge that as you go farther into that, and this is, this is my thought on it, but as you go farther into that, um, 
territory, the harder it becomes to do that, I think. And so I think there's a lot of things like artificial intelligence or machine learning that may help that with animation retargeting, uh, making smart decisions on the fly in conjunction with, um, you know, with the operators out there. Mm-hmm. So I, I think that's one thing. Um, cost obviously depends on what part you, you know, look at. There's costs, costs for some of the stuff up sometimes, although in the long term, I think that it, it, um, it definitely pays for itself and definitely helps you speed up your production pipelines. And I think it's especially useful right now in a, conditions like this where everybody's remote and we're still able to keep shooting um, because we can use multi-user to, to, to come in together. Um, on a very practical level, like a filmmaking level, and this, this is probably my stupid answer, but I think that planning it all ahead of time and getting getting out there and getting it shot, it seems like that is one of those things that we don't like. We like to have the flexibility of this, but if you plan it all out, you really get. To, I think you get better results. Um, and you know, it's sometimes it can be overplanned, and you get there, and it's there's a discovery process. But I think that's also a challenge too, at least for one of the teams. Like we, you know, try to plan all that out because we move so quickly. But again, the flexibility of this stuff is that it lets you. Just do it on the fly. Um, so, I think I think overall, though, the, the challenge is really taken to the finish line with this stuff. Um, although we are doing that in some places, I think it's just the level of that and how fast you get to the finish line. So, and it's such an exciting field to see because I mean, it's it's very new. It's growing at an extremely rapid pace, and sort of what we're getting to be a part of. Um, all of us and, and see the outcome of this. It's just super exciting. And, you know, uh, we mentioned this before, but it, it is just we're going to see more and more and more, you know, shoots where the final pictures were actually done in real time. Yeah, it's cool. And, it, you know, I'll tell you what I like about it. One of the things I love about it is this, you know, I've said it kind of at the start of the stream too, is that we're working with a virtual world. I like the idea that you can create reality in some ways, you know, and it's maybe imaginary or whatever, but I think it's really cool that we can jump into these worlds and we can create content in these worlds. And in some ways, the the, the division between the virtual world and the real world, there's some blurriness there. So we're starting to see that. And I'll be interested to see how that goes in the future. But um, I think that that's kind of an exciting thing when you start to get things that come in, you know, from either world. And I think for events, concerts, like we're, we're talking about, that's really cool, man, to be able to, you know, to see some of the stuff virtually yeah. and experience experience that in ways that you may not even be able to experience if you went to a physical concert. So kind of neat. Shooting sparks out of my fingertips. Exactly. Yeah. So, <laughs> it's yeah, a favorite of mine. That. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anything, anything you can think of. That's great. Grayson, thank you so much for coming on the stream today and walking us through the uh, VP workflow of of some of the events that we've done. Um, If you tune in later, the entire stream will be available on Twitch uh, perpetually right after the stream ends, as well as YouTube just a little bit later. I need some time to download, process, upload, you name it. Um, But you can go ahead and check that out. If you're curious about the other episodes, uh, that's part of Inside Unreal. The entire playlist is linked inside uh, in the About page on our Twitch page. Um, we frequently also tweet out uh, the events, and the initial post, if you're looking to catch the next one, actually happens on our forums. And so if you go to forums.unrealengine.com, you can find the event section, and that's where we post the information about the upcoming streams. Uh, next week, we are going to do the 2020 Spring Jam winner's announcement stream. So me and Amanda will be playing some games. I think it will be mostly me because of the... The setup that we're now in, we can't just sit and do it at a PC. Um, but we'll be playing the winner, uh, winners and announcing them on the stream for you. So tune in if you participate or if you're just excited to see all the amazing things that the community made. Uh, with that said, I think it's time for both of us to probably, I, I need to eat a late lunch, take a restroom break, uh, <laughs> and then get back to it. But with that said, thanks again, Grayson. Bye, chat. Hope you all are having a great weekend. All right. It's good seeing you. Thanks for having me on, too. I appreciate it, man. Uh, Anytime. We will nice do this. Week. And <laughs> we will do this again. All right. Bye, everyone. Mm-hmm.